UFOs Part 3, Return of the Overkill. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, I think this is a show that a lot of you have been waiting for. UFOs Part 3, we once again have Marty in the studio with us. How's it going, man? Welcome, buddy. Snake Force back in the queue. That's That's right. right. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the Watcher will be joining us shortly. He's not quite ready yet. Yeah, right. Yeah, (laughs) that's what he says. Uh, So, yeah, we're we're really glad to have Marty back. We're going to... Uh, he's been deep diving into this topic, and uh, he says we gave him too much time, and so now he has too many notes. <laughs> yeah, we're going full nuts this time. All right, <laughs> full nuts and bolts. Full nuts That's and right. bolts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but before we get into that, let's go ahead and do space weather news. Barely in it. <laughs> From spaceweather.com. Return of the Red Auroras. Yeah? See? They got the they got the theme down too, right? Return of the, you know. Yeah. Uh, last night, November 11th and 12th, rare red auroras returned to Finland. The red color was not visible with the naked eye, but large red streaks appeared in short exposures with our cameras. Reports photographer Rayan Elizane. Uh, just like last month, when the same thing happened, the red hue appeared when the solar wind was slow and unusually dense. Uh. Oh, that's interesting. And they got another thing on here about finding Comet Atlas. Let's see. Uh, mm. How to find Comet Atlas. If you know your way around the constellation Orion, you won't have trouble finding Comet Atlas, uh, also labeled C-2020 M3. The comet is located to the right and slightly below the belt of Orion. Uh, that was on November 9th. Now the green comet is just above the belt. Comet Atlas is in a new location every night as it glides towards Orion's head. A key date is November 15th. Within hours of its closest approach to Earth, Comet Atlas will pass a fraction of a degree from the bright star Bellatrix, uh, Orion's left shoulder. Deep exposures may show this star shining through the outskirts of Atlas's atmosphere. That's awesome. Yeah, so that might be interesting. Note, you cannot see Comet Atlas with your unaided eye. At closest approach on November 14th, the comet will shine like an eighth magnitude star, which is six times too dim for naked eye visibility. It is, however, an easy target for backyard telescopes and off-the-shelf cameras. All right. You can get some shots of it. Yeah. Yeah, so let's see. Current conditions. Solar wind speed is 415.8 kilometers per second. The density is 5.3 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, sunspot number right now is 24. So total spotless days in 2020 is down to 65%. And let's see. There are 24 sunspots right now? Yes. 24. Are they up on the, like the 29th degree? Are they Uh, like a high? The two that are facing us are down in the Southern hemisphere of the sun. Cause I was just listening to the, um, the the Giza power plant episodes and and I think it was Robert Valter was talking about how the all the sunspots you know how they start in the, oh yeah they'll be in a band yeah upper or lower latitudes yep. I guess and it's all they all start right around just under thirty degrees yeah that and looks right they're just yeah they're and, just down low and yeah. he was pointing out that uh, Giza is also right there at like twenty nine degrees oh, and yeah. Jupiter's red spot is all on these like oh 29 yeah degrees. yeah Oh, yeah. That was really cool. Yeah, these would be down where Jupiter's red spot is, down in that area. Yeah. On the cool. lower, on the southern hemisphere. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And let's see. Neutron counts today is 9.7% plus, rated as high uh, above the space age average. And, okay, so there's a new, uh, a new stat here that people have been asking for, the planetary K index. So KP right now equals zero, which is quiet. And the 24-hour max has been two, which is also rated as quiet. So the KP is uh, the K index or K factor. It has to do with the aurora and high-energy particles and how they're generated during geomagnetic storms. Okay. So the idea is is that how much of this... Because I think that some people... There is some evidence that... uh, 
that uh, certain psychic abilities may work better or worse during certain KP numbers. Hmm. So I'll have to keep looking into that, but there's the stat for right now. I don't understand it. We'll go through some of the data later. Uh, uh, Space Weather News or SpaceWeather.com has a whole article on what it means, so we can go through that some other time. But you got the numbers. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> That's the KP index right now. I knew it. Planetary K index is KP equals zero. That was pretty obvious today <laughs> that it was at zero. It was pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Watcher says he's here. Says sketchy audio. Welcome, Watcher. Yeah. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any sketchy audio on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A and send us a care package. Uh, well, we were supposed to send you a care package. That's right. Oh, yeah, Anne, that's right. So. Yeah. yeah, she said we need to get you better equipment. <laughs> so. so we'll wait for the next um, launch, and uh, <laughs> we'll get that sent off that's to you. That's right. <laughs> All right, Marty, where are we going today? All right, well, <clears throat> in this episode, I want to try to bust some of the misconceptions that uh, are commonly, or, you know, you hear a lot of people make references to Nazi UFOs and their connection to the Foo Fighters and all during World War II. And so some, I'm going to try to make some uh, points here. Uh, the things I want to try to illustrate is one, contrary to popular belief, sightings of unknown craft began before World War II. Um, second, um, sightings were not limited to small fireballs. In fact, many were of large structured craft. Mm. Um, three, the strange encounters were also not limited to the European and Pacif Pacific theaters of war. Four, um, the Axis powers also encountered the strange objects and were just as per perplexed as, as the uh, Allies. And five, both... U.S. and military military investigations and the secrecy surrounding them began long before Kenneth Arnold's sighting in 1947. Okay. So. So I've heard that that you know a lot of pilots would see these things during the war, and were they? Is it true that they were sort of encouraged to not really report it? Is that right? Yeah, I'll, there's. I'll give some specific quotes from okay. some of the some of the documents that have been obtained in the years in the years since then. Okay. Um, a lot of wh what I'm going to discuss in this first in the first segment um, is taken from the book "Strange Company: Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II" by Keith Chester. Uh, the book provides a vast amount of referenced material concerning. The mist, all the mysterious objects that were encountered during the war, which there were a variety of types. There were actually, there were three specific types that were encountered repeatedly. Okay. Um, his, the, this first segment is just going to be kind of a, an overview of the array of different type of encounters that occurred. Um, some of which, again, have, began prior to, to World War II. Um, this first one, um, in, Suc in Succes, England, uh, on the evening of July 5th, 1932, four Royal Air Force Hawker Fury 1 biplanes uh, were flying in a crisscross training uh, exercise and when they encountered a light that shone directly down onto the center of their formation from high altitude. Experiencing mechanical trouble, two of the Hawkers were unable to remain in the formation and separated from the group. Captain, Ni Captain Nigel Tompkins and Lieutenant Bruce H. Thompson were forced to make an emergency landing when both of their plane's engines quit. Hmm. On their way down, Thomas passed so close to the intense light that it caused burns to his face and hands. Wow. 1932. Man. Okay. That was, those guys were in England? Yes. Is that what you said? Okay. Uh, this next one was... On December 31st, 1933, uh, four Swedish Flying Corps, uh, flying corps uh, issued orders, the fourth, I'm sorry, fourth Swiss, Swiss Flying Corps issued orders instructing their Army aviators to chase unknown aircraft <laughs> in an attempt to discover where the intruders were flying out of, uh, believed to be a mountain base. Two Swedish airplanes carried out the aerial reconnaissance. Their attempts failed. 
Both planes were lost in the search, but fortunately the crews did survive. On Christmas Day, a second effort was initiated by Lieutenant Wan, uh, Wanberg, who conducted a lone scouting expedition on foot and never returned. Hmm. In an attempt to locate him, three skiers embarked on a rescue mission, and they too disappeared. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little creepy. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, as we go through these, you're going to start hearing these things like, wow, that, that sounds familiar. You know, yeah. a lot of these have been recurring themes for quite some time. Um, on February 3rd, 1934, um, the New York Times reported continued night flights over northern Finland, Sweden, and Norway by so-called ghost aviators, which have caused so much apprehension here as to prompt ge the general staff to organize reconnoitering of, wide of a wide scale by army airplanes all over northern fin Finland and remains a deep mystery. Mm -hmm. In Oslo, Norway, um, a very unusual sighting re was reported on April 1st, 1934. In the newspaper, the, the Titans... Tengen. According to the story, five witnesses observed a very large airplane over Standorgen. Uh, one witness, a 16-year-old boy, said he saw a machine with bril in the brilliant moonlight. The object had eight propellers. Um, as the airplane descended, it did not land, but began to move in wide circles over the water. From his vantage point, the boy was able to clearly observe the object, object noting that it had cabin windows and they were all alit, hmm. which in 1934, there wouldn't have been any large aircraft with yeah, cabin with, windows. And with yeah. that many engines, was that a thing back then? Now, that was biplane period, so. Yeah. Um, there so, may have been, but secret. flying at low altitude and circling over the water was, yeah. it would is be this unusual. Like, is this like... Uh, Similar to the ghost rocket stuff that that was happening in that area. Yeah, that that way actually the ghost rocket stuff happened right after World War II. That was oh, more like okay. forty six. All right, all right, we'll, all right. That, we'll get to those further down the list. Okay, um, these are all pre war here, or you know at least the United States. It's interesting you know, though because it like follows this pattern that I've noticed, and in some cases it doesn't always follow this pattern. But there's this interesting thing that a lot of times the sightings seem to be of tech that's like just a little bit ahead of where we are, you know, maybe, maybe 40 years ahead, maybe 50 years ahead, maybe less. I don't know, but it's interesting because, you know, he's seeing a plane that you would say, okay, yeah, that, that, that was something that you would see in the fifties, right. Or the That's 40s. why there's the idea that it's like secret government tech because yeah. their tech is actually always yeah. leaps and bounds a few ahead, decades of what, ahead of yeah. what we know about. Yeah. Well, like I said, you gave me too much time, so <laughs> I actually had an entire segment dedicated to that specific question, uh, and has some theories. I have some theories as to why we're seeing this. Well, I, but I, if, I would also like to add that there's a parallel in the crop circle phenomenon, because at, you know they start out fairly simple, and then when people start saying, "Oh, well, you know, you can make them like this," then they get more and more complex, and they happen <laughs> yeah. quicker and fast. You know, it's just yeah, like that's true. I don't want to give away any spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> if we do a part four, we'll get into that. Deep. All right, cool. <laughs> I don't want if. to. Get, I have a lot of a lot of information, so I don't want to. I don't want to get off topic too much. <laughs> <laughs> this is the tangent cube. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. No. No. <laughs> Fine. I You've got your thing. Let's go. All right. Um, <laughs> In 1935, a mystery plane overflights, uh, let's see, uh, over Palestine, Texas. Witnesses uh, were amazed to see a bright shaft of light suspended vertically to the ground, and it remained motionless high in the evening sky. Uh, also in the U.S., Howard S. Bear uh, was bringing in the new year in, his 19, in 1937, spending some time in the air uh, flying... Uh, to North Carolina in his Curtis Wright. Around noon over Virginia, he had, he had no trouble identifying the shape of an aircraft about a thousand feet below him moving across his flight path. He watched as the 30 to 40 foot object passed by, noting that there were no signs of windows or propellers. He said it looked like a gondola, gunmetal in color, and both of the ends were turned up. Sounds like mm. a canoe. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Wow. Okay. Both the ends were turned up. 
what is that noise? <laughs> My laptop. <laughs> it's got an update. <laughs> okay. In Norway on uh, February 11th, 1937, the crew of a fishing vessel named the Fran spotted something in the night sky while departing Kavlesk. Around 9 p.m., they noticed a large airplane with red and green glowing lights resting atop the water. The Franz captain turned his boat around to offer his assistance, but as he approached, almost immediately the plane's lights were extinguished in a cloak of cl- a cloak within a cloud of smoke before vanishing. Hmm. Cloud of smoke. That's a recurring theme. Yeah. By the end of 1937, 1937, witnesses near the German-Polish border described objects in the sky resembling swords and coffins reminiscent of those observed in North and South America years prior. Hmm. Flying coffins. Seems like we've seen depictions of that in yeah. more historical yep. paintings. And, and swords, stuff. yeah, that's yep. right. Crosses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in the summer of 1938, um, over Somerville, Massachusetts, resident Malcolm B. Perry was walking home uh, under the visible moon just after midnight. <laughs> For close to a minute, he saw far above him a silvery object which passed silently. It was the size of a 12-inch ruler at arm's length, having no cabin windows below or propellers attached to the object. Perry was able to determine that the silvery object was slimmer than a conventional blimp, and it had tapered ends coming to sharp points. There were four rectangular portholes on the side that emitted an orange hue from within, but curiously, there were silhouettes of people looking down at him. Hmm. Again, another recurring theme. Yeah. Yep. So he thought it was a, it looked like a blimp, but it was pointed, but it didn't have a balloon. Is that he the said idea? It was more, it was silver. It was slimmer than a conventional balloon and tapered on the ends. Okay. And it had four rectangular portholes on the sides. Yeah. So, cause like a, a blimp would have a, a huge thing above the cabin, the gondola, or whatever it's called, right? Right, and I may be, I may be like projecting on this, but if you, you know, you look at the typical cigar-shaped UFOs that are reported, yeah. they are very often reported to have these lights along the side. Yeah, yeah, holes that's what I'm here. saying. Is like so, a, yeah. a blimp in the big balloon part is not going to have windows with people. Right, in it. It, and it would have a <laughs> gondola hanging below. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, on December 22nd, 1941, in uh, Ithaca, New York, resident George Boger, uh, an electrical engineer, stopped his car to watch a round, sharply outlined object speed silently across the sky. The sun reflected off its bright aluminum or chrome finish. Uh, Boger estimated that the disc-shaped object had a diameter of 100 feet, flew no more than 400 feet off the ground, at around 300 miles an hour and made no sound. Hmm. That's, uh, yeah, that's really strange. Something flying that fast, making no sound. Yeah. Because, I mean, typically you'd think um, no engines or perfectly quiet engines, but just an object moving through the air at that that speed is going to make a lot of noise. Yeah. You're going to see... These sightings are going to escalate. They're going to get weirder as we go down the okay. list, but they're going to be. There will be consistencies, and the lack of sound is definitely one of them. Um, yeah, like they're not displacing the air. Correct. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Dutch cruiser Tromp was sailing um, in the Tremor Sea, as part uh, which is part of the Indian Ocean, when the crewmen were puzzled by a large illuminated disc approaching at terrific speed. For almost four hours, they watched in amazement as this wingless object circled above the ship. Finally, the disc departed the area at an estimated 3,500 miles an hour. Oof. No idea how they made that estimation. Yeah, how you but that, yeah. yeah, It's difficult not knowing how close it is to you to be able to determine the right. size and the speed. You know, those yeah, are... exactly. <clears throat> uh, over Evanston, Illinois, Reverend Robert H. Moore and six others attempted... Uh, attending the Seabury Western Theological Semin- Seminary, witnessed a sharply defined rectangle, uh, about three times longer at, than at it was wide. Color was a light gray, 
much lighter and brighter than the evening sky. No perceptible shading indicated a flat surface rather than a cylindrical shape viewed at 90 degrees to the axis. No apparent motion for about 10 minutes. So it just floated there? Yeah, a rectangle, which is kind of... <laughs> flying odd. doors. Yeah, flying doors. Yeah. <laughs> so now we get to what is arguably the first major UFO event of the 20th century. Okay. And it's one that you hear kind of... Um, you hear a lot of excuses for, you know, misidentifications that it caused it. But when you, when you actually read the details and what the people involved say, kind of changes your, maybe changes your view of it a little bit. And this was the infamous Battle of Los Angeles. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, on February 24th, 1942, around 1900 hours, alarm sounded in the Los Angeles area. A high number of flares and blinking lights were observed near the defense plants. A few hours later at, at uh, 1.44, radar units again picked up an unidentified aerial target. At 2 a.m., uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Keith R. Martin and the 4th Intercept Command confirmed a well-tracked target. At 2.21, the unidentified target came within miles of the coast, so the regional, contro the regional controller issued a blackout. A few minutes later, at 2.43, anti-aircraft batteries in the vicinity saw something in the sky. Responding with gunfire, they sparked a chain reaction, and the night erupted into a frenzy of pyrotechnics. Uh, many eyewitnesses said that they saw something else flying in the area. A triangular grouping of glowing lights was heading inland over the, over the coast near the defense factory areas. Air Raid Warden Raymond Angier uh, an employee of the Douglas Aircraft Company witnessed the un unidentified aircraft approaching Los Angeles. Quote, I saw what had triggered the alarm, a formation of six to nine luminous white dots in a triangular formation visible in the northwest, unquote. Running back inside and up onto the roof of his home, Anger got a better look. The formation of lumin, quote, luminous white dots was flying in a triangular formation, moving very slowly at about 20,000 feet. Returning to the street, he saw tr the triangle of lights were almost at zenith, possibly slightly higher. Angier heard sporadic anti-aircraft fire, and between bursts, he heard no sound from the objects. Another witness, Paul T. Collins, saw bright, saw bright red spots of light moving in a strange manner. The light's altitude was approximately 10,000 feet and had appeared out of nowhere, zigzagging from side to side. Hmm. Collins watched guns of the anti-aircraft batteries near the Douglas Aircraft uh, Company, also his place of employment, fire with, at the red objects. Taking into, quote, taking into account our distance from, Lo from Long Beach, Collins said, the extensive pattern of firing from widely uh, separated anti-aircraft batteries, the movement of the unidentified red objects among and around the bursting shells in wide orbits, we estimated the top speed conservatively at five miles per second. Hmm. In southwest Los Angeles, Lieutenant Miles reported seeing three planes flying at 9,000 feet in a V formation, even though the, his radar showed nothing on the screen. Sergeant Bowman, uh, also with a 214th, saw five planes flying in a wedge formation that changed to a T formation. Lieutenant Anderson, with a 78th Coastal Artillery Station at the Douglas Aircraft Factory in Long Beach, saw a single aircraft in his field glasses and confirmed on radar flying at 20,000 feet. Uh, on February 25th, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox declared the raid nothing more than a false alarm, but Army authorities disagreed. After waiting a day to get the facts straight, Secretary of War Harry L. Stimson announced to the War Department indicating that possibly 15 enemy-operated unidentified planes were involved. Stimson determined that there were two possibilities. The aircraft were either Japanese planes launched from a submarine sitting offshore or commercial planes flown by the enemy from secret fields in California or Mexico. Stimson based his findings on information in the reports received from the Army Chiefs of Staff, General C. Martin, uh, Marshall, 
who received details from military commands on the West Coast. Is, so, that, a, is that a thing? Launching aircraft from submarines? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, is there a, never that, heard of that. I think they're reaching there. A little. Yeah, <sighs> but I mean, seems like a good idea. Could what did <laughs> put some planes in a sub and <laughs> cruise them in? Did the uh, did planes have the ability at that time to fly at twenty thousand feet? Don't you have yes, to? Yes, they did. They did? Okay. They did, you, but... You got to um, be pressurized to do that. Yeah. And there were submarines that carried that carried seaplanes on on them, but they would carry one. One seaplane. Yeah. These were consistently... And, I, and, I'm, and I'm only giving a sample of what's in the book, but consistently, these were a, of aircraft in a triangular formation. Yeah. So these... I mean, it seems unlikely that they would all be imagining the same thing. Right. They were probably seeing a formation, and one granted, guy said it were red lights. Somebody else said that they were bright white. But other than that, they were seeing basically a triangular formation of multiple craft moving it at at altitude. Well, if you notice, most of the descriptions, the altitudes were pretty consistent. So, and one of them did track it on at least one of the objects on radar. Yeah, and there's pretty watchers put up some of the more famous uh, newspaper photos of the. And here it says, a marshal immediately sent out a report to President Roosevelt. The following is the information we have from headquarters at this moment regarding the air alarm over Los Angeles of yesterday morning. The details at this hour, one, unidentified planes other than American Army or Navy planes were probably over Los Angeles, and they were fired on by elements of the 37th uh, CA barrage uh, between 312 and 415 a.m., these use, units expended 1,430 rounds of ammunition. Yeah. As many as 15 planes may have been involved flying at various speeds from what is officially reported as being very slow to as much as 200 miles an hour and at elevations from 9,000 to 1,800 or 18,000 feet. Yeah. And didn't they, they, even with all those rounds and how slow they were moving, they didn't hit one of them? They didn't knock any of them down? That's the weird part, right? Didn't they move off after this? Yeah, they and kept there, going, but there, you'll and see. There were some, I also remember reading that there were some people, there was so much anti-aircraft shells in the air that people in the city got wounded. Yeah, brain there were, yeah, I believe there were yeah, it was stuff fatalities like, as a result. Yeah, there were fatalities because yeah. these, these anti-aircraft shells were raining down on the populace. But they again, they blamed it on war nerves. <laughs> war nerves. Yeah. <laughs> so... About that time, overseas, um, in June tw on June 25th, 1942, a group of, of RAF Wellington bombers were headed south on a mission. While over Holland, First Flight Lieutenant Roman Sabrinsky, piloting one of the bombers, heard over his headset the rear gunner informing him that an aircraft was approaching from the rear. Unable to determine the exact distance, Sabrinsky saw a very bright light heading towards his aircraft. The object was the size of the moon, possibly a little bigger, and was visible high in the sky. Sabrinsky was able to discern that the object's, that the object's true color, since it, was, since it was well within firing range, was not white, but a shining copper, sort of dull like the setting sun, but not very intense. Approaching dangerously close to his aircraft, the object was approximately 200 yards away. Give him a blast, Sabrinsky ordered. The rear gunner, blazing away with all four machine guns, sent a hail of lead and tracer rounds towards the intruder. The tracer rounds, used to direct line of fire to the object, were hitting their mark. To the crew's surprise, the rounds were simply entering the object and not coming out the other side. The bullets were in, were either falling to, falling towards the ground, or passing through the object. They simply or, or were not and were not passing through the object. Hmm. They simply entered the ball of light and disappeared. Remarkably, with so many apparent hits, the object, the cr the crew could no, see no visible damage whatsoever. The shiny object suddenly changed position and at a terrific speed moved over the port side almost the same at the same distance of about 200 yards from the wing. Both the rear gunner and front gunner blasted away. Seeing the tracers entering the target from two angles, Sabrinsky was now sure that the object was around 200 yards away from his aircraft, receiving, receiving the full power, firepower from two machine guns. Sabrinsky recalled, quote, 
I moved over my seat in the cockpit and took the controls over myself. I did an evasive action. While I was doing quite violent maneuvers, moving the wings up and down, this thing stayed exactly at the extension of my wing. No matter what Sergeant or Lieutenant Sabrinsky did, tried, the object was there like a shadow. Pulling out all his evasive maneuvers, the machine gunners resumed their assault. A moment later, the object moved to the front of the aircraft, stayed in that position for a period, and then moving in an upward direction, quote, it took off at fantastic speed, at least a 45-degree angle, and disappeared between the stars. Minutes after the encounter, another Wellington bomber crew traveling not far behind Sabrinsky encountered the same phenomenon. Uh-huh. Mm. So that sort of um, parallels the L.A. sighting. In other words, yeah. the aircraft, the anti-aircraft guns weren't having an effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, so the watcher's got a couple good points here. One, he says, uh, I think he's right. The seaplanes probably can't fly at 18,000 feet, right? The pon- I mean, can a pontoon plane fly that high? I don't probably know. Not. Yeah. Uh, and he also says, there were casualties. The Battle of Los Angeles claimed six lives. Three civilians were killed directly by friendly fire, while three others suffered heart attacks during the hour-long siege. And a number of buildings were also damaged by uh, their own anti-aircraft guns. So they shot all this ammunition at them and did no damage. Same with that plane. It opened up every gun it had. And that's that was interesting that the pilot was now with the front and rear gunner going with the angles. He could make a better estimate on how, how big it was and how far away it was from his plane. Oh, that's cool. Uh, on, the, on the morning of August 5th, 1942, an aircraft approached the USS Helm. Considered an enemy aircraft, a full alert was sounded and there was no chance of it striking first. The aircraft, as, as the aircraft approached, three cruisers and seven destroyers executed a preemptive strike, a full-fledged Navy welcome. Through the dense wall of lead, the aircraft continued unscathed, getting closer to the helm. The aircraft reached within 3,000 yards. It executed a sharp turn and increased in speed and proceeded to circle the entire fleet. The witnesses... Who, who the witness who was assigned security detail observed the craft through a pair of 750 power uh, power field binoculars, noting that it did not appear to be any kind of known U.S. or Japanese aircraft. It was approximately 90 feet in diameter, looked something like a silver-colored cigar-shaped object. At times, the aircraft had a f- oval or flat shape to it with a round dome on top. Both the captain and the executive officer had a good look. They confirmed that it had the appearance of a streamlined cigar. According to one witness, the directional control, rele- directional control released all guns and said for the gun captains to go local controls. Although the director could keep up with him, they weren't able to take enough of a lead out on the machine to allow it to swing far enough ahead to hit him. The direct control instead, or, or should I say, the direct controller insisted the object had reached speeds of ten thousand miles per hour. Whoa! Wow. The direct and he was con- calculating that by how fast how he had to fast swing the, the gun. turrets could turn. Yeah. Exactly. They oh, could not crap. swing the turrets fast enough to get the to, to guns get a lead to on lead on the guy yeah. is over there like. <laughs> 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 All right, let's. This is great. We got to take a break though. Okay. Already done with the first segment. It's fantastic. All right. Back with more UFOs after this. Snacks! back brothers of the servant podcast just cracked open uh some brew pastor beers sharing them around the cube here all with right, marty cheers cheers, cheers, gentlemen. cheers. all right <laughs> Aha. and of course we have the ufo researcher extraordinaire thrice removed <laughs> that's right <laughs> so we're gonna start this segment off with a really odd one um this happened in 
um, the summer of 1942. Uh, in the Pacific, near the island of Tasmania, uh, Major Brennan uh, of the uh, Australian Royal Air Force and his crew spotted an object in the clouds. At 5.50 p.m., this is a quote, at 5.50 p.m. we were flying some miles east of the Tasmanian Peninsula when all of a sudden there came out of the cloud bank a singular airfoil of glistening bronze in color. The major recalled, quote, I say it was around 150 feet long and around 50 feet in diameter. On its upper surface was a dome or cupola from which it seemed to be reflecting flashes as if sun, the sun struck something which might have been, might or might not have been a helmet worn by something inside. On the other end of the airfoil, it thinned out to sort of a fin. Every now and again, there came from from its keel a greenish blue flash. It turned at a small angle towards us, and all of a sudden, I was amazed to see framed in a white circle on the front of the dome, the image of a grinning Chelsea cat. What? <laughs> it went off at a hell of a pace and dived straight down into the Pacific and went under throwing up a regular whirlpool of waves, just, if it, just as if it had been a submarine. Whoa. See, that sounds like, you know, World War II. Like, like uh, what's that plane? The, the Warthog? You know, they used to paint the face on the front yeah, of the warthog. Yeah, too. It sounds like the, the grinning cat could be a painted uh, thing on it. Yeah. Yeah, I would have. I'm pretty sure I it's a warthog. Look, that look up a, that plane, watcher. A misidentification if it were not for the fact that it dove into the water. water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's kind of odd. There were, I, I'm going on the theme here of, of like, you know, advanced military stuff. I'm not scurp derping you. I'm just saying. <laughs> They did paint, yeah, they would paint mean shark, faces, shark faces oh, in yeah, front yeah. of these. Yeah, and that one, I think, was a was a tank. It, it, it was designed to take out tanks. It was, like, highly maneuverable. It could do these dives. And... Uh, in mid, uh, mid-August 1942, German infantry in the Tula region of Moscow were going through their tasks. Then, according to one inf- infantryman, I saw the most baffling object of my life. Out of a cloud... Uh, out of a cloud appeared suddenly a huge cigar-shaped object, something like a zeppelin, but much bulkier and rounder at the front. The size was tremendous, approximately 300 yards long and 100 yards high at its thickest part. He could see no markings, and it was an aluminum-hued color and was very smooth-looking. Moving out of the clouds, the object's snout pointed downward, remaining stationary for at least a minute giving the infantry, infantry men time to see that there were no visible windows or signs of a gondola. The object leveled out and then turned its nose upward in, a slow, and, in slow and direct motions. In contrast to the surprising outburst of energy, when it suddenly began climbing at terrific speed, disappearing within seconds and leaving no vapor trail, the witnesses were especially amazed at hearing no sound when the object shot upward out of sight. The German soldiers thought it was some kind of new Russian we- secret weapon. <laughs> yeah, what, what did you say, 300 yards by 100 yards? That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's really big to go that fast. It's funny how that 300 yards number seems to be used a lot. And I don't yeah, know if that's a per- right. Is it a perceptual, a perceptional thing? Well, I mean, well, a lot of people that that field. shoot guns recognize yeah, things three. in like 100, 200, 300, 400 yards, right? Because that's a common distance that you're used to looking at when you're shooting rifles. Yeah, I, and I guess you hear a lot of a lot of references to oh, it was as big as a football field. Yeah. This one, yeah, three yeah. football fields. Yeah. You know, it's weird how that's a three football fields long. And a yeah, football we're more field like tall. we're more like it was bigger than a pyramid, or it's like. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 15 T-Rexes. <laughs> <laughs> Two things I've never seen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's I mean, it, it is interesting how they would, you know, they think it's the it's a secret weapon from the other from the enemy guy. But something that big moving that fast, I mean, what did he say at the end there? It it went upwards and disappeared. 
Right. It it it's he the, he's, they described that it tilted its nose down initially, and yeah. then it tilted its nose up and shot upward. Yeah. Which again, that wouldn't you know you wouldn't Blitz imagine do doing that. a zeppelin doing yeah, something no. like that. Yeah. Um, a British special uh, air service operative uh, learned that unknown craft were caught many times on film during the making of propaganda films. The footage was cut from the film's final editing, but remained in the original negatives. The operative watched the films as they were and described that they were as they were clear. He said you could perfectly see the movements of the objects beside the bomber formations. In fact, the footage was so amazing that the operative was repeatedly startled each time the aircraft appeared on screen. He was he was unable to obtain copies of the film, but the operative managed to convince the United Nations news to give him a few copies of of photographs which he still has in his possession. Mm. And again, this book is heavily every every one of these has the references. Yeah. This guy goes into a lot of detail. So this is all coming from the book that you referenced at the beginning. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're we're going to be moving into. There are so many of these. We could probably be here for hours just going through all of these. But I'm I'm working <laughs> towards I'm working towards something, and I'll move into maybe some of the more more detailed ones um, here. Um, here, uh, RAF squadron leader Brian F uh, Fro and his crew were returning from a bombing mission in southern France. Ronald Claridge uh, was operating the Lancaster bomber's radar set, monitoring the screen for approaching German night fighters. Suddenly, a malfunction of some type occurred, which caused his radar unit to stop working. Claridge quickly reported the problem to the pilot, who interrupted him, just yelling, what the hell was that? Trying to see what was causing what was causing Frau so much concern, uh, Claridge uh, climbed into the Astrodome. Now he saw he too saw the amazing sight. Sitting off the starboard side of the was a string of lights. Cambridge stared at the spectacle. The lights were circular, rather like portholes of a ship. The color was very bright yellow, changing to intense white. I estimated that they were about a thousand yards from the airplane. The ones nearest our Lancaster were the largest and brightest. They stretched fore and aft what, to what seemed in, like infinity. After about 30 seconds, I could see where a part of the enormous disk, I could see part of the enormous disk. Stunned, the gunners held their fire, and, though no, and no order was given to fire upon them. The disk hung motionless for about three minutes and then suddenly shot ahead and was gone. They heard no noise from the engines. Hmm. <clears throat> so the lights were, they looked like they went off into infinity, but it was like lights on the rim. Is that what they're they're I, describing, sort of? I guess. So it was like an enormous disc, was, disc. Yeah, the disc was so huge that, wow. Uh, according to witness A.W. Shawansky, uh, quote, I was, it was the summer of 1944 in Italy. During an offensive action in Lortero, at 10.30 a.m. in an almost cloudless sky, there suddenly appeared an egg-shaped, metallically glistening, motionless object. Our anti-aircraft guns immediately opened a barrage of fire. The shells burst below the object, and after a while our battery stopped when we realized the German batteries were shelling at the same object. <laughs> They're both shooting it. Mm hmm. <laughs> hmm. Uh, in late September 1944, Lance Corporal Carlson York and the, with the 1st Canadian Army was just outside the city when he saw a glowing globe traveling in the direction of in the front line in Antwerp. Antwerp. Um, it seemed to be three or four feet in diameter and looked as though it was made of cloudy glass with a light inside. Quote, I gave, it gave a soft white glow. Its altitude was about 40 feet, uh, speed about 30 miles an hour. There was no sound of any sort. He noted feet. that the object, yeah, four, 40 feet off the ground, <laughs> traveling at 30 miles an hour. A 300 like, foot diameter globe. No, 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 it was four, 40 foot. Oh, 40, 40 foot. Feet, yeah. 40 foot diameter, 30 feet off the ground. Oh, no, I'm oh. sorry. Three, it was three feet, three to four feet in diameter, oh, okay. 40 feet off the ground, traveling at about 30 miles an hour. All right. 
made no sound of any sort. He noted the object was simply drifting in the wind, but obviously powered and controlled. Immediately, uh, immediately it had gone beyond view and followed by an, uh, oh, immediately after it f had gone beyond view, it was followed by another, which in turn was followed by five in all. Hmm. Wow. Now, is that more like a Foo Fighter? Right. That's actually where we're going. I'm sort okay. of, this, there's, there's a little bit of a theme to this thing. They're sort <laughs> of evolving as we go through. Yeah, okay. Um, on the evening of November 24th, 1944, uh, Air, Army Air Captain uh, William Leet was flying over northern Italy near Treese. Seconds later, Leet noticed a blinding light and felt an unbearable heat. It had gone so quickly... It, it, as it, it was gone as, so, as quickly as it came. Assuming it was a powerful searchlight crossing their path, he wondered why the Nazis had failed to notice the aircraft and blast them out of the sky. Then second la seconds later, a round amber light sitting off, to his off his left wing caught his attention. The object's outline was a perfect circle, too perfect. It was co the color was a luminous orange-yellow, too luminous. Uh, the upper left waist of the um, the upper left waist ball gunner anxiously prepared to fire at the strange object, but Leet ordered him not to shoot. Not knowing what the object was, he was told he told his men to keep it under surveillance. The object was not hostile and made no attempt to attack. It appeared to be close to our wingtip, though perhaps a hundred yards laterally and five yards to the rear. Sergeant Harris, the upper gunner, got a perfect view of the object. Um, Captain Leet asked him to describe what he was seeing. He goes, I don't know how to describe it. It's not an airplane or anything I've seen before. It was so perfectly round, I can't believe it. I guess it was about 10 feet in diameter and 75 to 100 feet from us. The rest of the crew concurred that the object was about 100 yards away from their B-17. Watching the entire time, the tail gunner asked Leet if he thought it if if he thought what it, if he knew what it was. He goes, I wish I knew, Leet said. It was a... It hasn't bothered us, so we don't want to shoot at it. We wouldn't feel right about shooting an unknown object that seems to be from another world. Wow. <laughs> I, That's cool. It's interesting to me, too, that, uh, you know, they're like, well, it's not attacking. But I'm like, how do you know that? You know, I mean, if, if it's already anomalous, uh, how do you know if it's attacking you or not, you know, I mean. Right. You have to assume it's, you know, in, in, at wartime, you have to assume it's hostile first. Yeah. And I, I think he was saying, OK, he was, I, I don't know the way that read. It sounded to me like he's it's not making any moves to attack us, but he's thinking in conventional ways. But a luminous ball that's made of some super high tech thing could be killing you while sitting over there and you would never know it. You know, obviously it didn't. But. You know what I'm saying? Right. Just interesting. But of course, these guys are, they're, they're on a mission and they're set and, and what they're looking for is conventional attacks against them. So a floating sphere that isn't shooting at you is not attacking you, but it could have been. The uh, 415th Night Fighter Squadron was probably one of the squadrons that encountered them most often. There are many, many reports from them, from different pilots. Um, and it's also interesting that that's where the term came from. Let me read this. It says, The men of the 415th Night Fighter Squadron did not care what anyone at headquarters or, or above thought. They knew what, that they were an excellent unit of top-notch airmen and had nothing to prove. During a conversation, one of the pilots suggested naming the strange lights. Nearby, pilot and operations officer Charlie Horn chimed in on a, the conversation, suggesting to they should call them Foo Fighters, a name gleaned from some, some of the men's favorite comic strips, Smokey Stover. Huh. The cartoon followed the escapades of Smokey Stover, a madcap fireman uh, who named his fire truck the Foo Mobile. It was often stated in the comic, where there's Foo, there's fire. <laughs> I didn't know that's where the name came from. That's cool. But yeah, you know, I, I wonder if there's there's probably no way to do this, but it'd be interesting to find out, <clears throat> for example, if there was a higher incidence of, like, cancer in these guys that encountered these things. You know what I mean? If they were in any way radioactive, you know what I'm saying? Like, they it could have been dangerous. 
Yeah. And just sit so like there, there's probably no way to figure this out. They were shooting neutrons at them. Yeah. They didn't know. Right. There are so many reports I have in here. Uh, I don't want to bore everybody to death with because there are so many of them. <laughs> it's not boring. The only reason I'm trying to go through some of them is that there are consistencies that I kind of want to point out in this. And it leads into the next segment because as we get further into this, we'll get into the discussion of how many um, people believed, including at the time they believed that they were some type of German super weapon. But, um, Except those guys thought it was from another world. That was interesting. Right. So and was the, it the higher ups that thought that or? Well, we'll get into it. We'll get into All it. Right. right. This big old the guy thing is, honestly, everybody, yeah. every everybody time we ask you a question, you're like, yeah, grin. Yeah. Yeah. Try not to get ahead of me here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Everybody seemed to think it was the other guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on January 2nd, 1945, multiple newspapers carried um, a story, uh, not mentioning who wrote the article but, but and which unit was interviewed. The New York Times was among the first major statewide newspaper to carry a story, quote, balls of fire stalk U.S. fighters in night assaults over Germany. It read, uh, American night fighter base, France, January 1st. Germans have thrown something new into the night skies over Germany. The weird, mysterious Foo Fighter balls of fire that race alongside the wings of American bow fighters flying in uh, intruder missions over the Reich. American pilots have encountered these eerie Foo Fighters for more than a month in the night on their night flights. No one apparently knows exactly what these sky weapons are. The balls of fire appear suddenly and, accom and accompany the planes for miles. They appear to be radio controlled from the ground and keep up with our planes flying 300 miles an hour. Official intelligence reports reveal there are three kinds of lights we call Foo Fighters. Lieutenant Donald Mears of Chicago said, One is red balls of fire which appear off the wings and fly along with us. The second is a vertical row of three balls of fire which fly in front of us. And the third is a group of 15 lights which appear off in the distance, like a Christmas tree lit up in the air, and fl which flicker on and off. The pilots of this night fighter squadron in operation since September of 1943 find these fireballs the weirdest thing they have ever encountered. They are convinced that the Foo Fighters are designed to be some type of psychological military weapon, although the nature of the balls of fire uh, is to not attack the planes. Yeah. Hmm. So were they encountered in places other than when they were flying over Germany? Yes, that's okay. where I'm going. All when, right. when, uh, well, I mean, the first story, right? They were seeing them floating right, 30, were, 40 feet off the ground. Oh, yeah. And those were, those were happening in the United States, in Sweden, in other countries, even in South America, prior to the war. Okay. During the war, we, because, because of the number of flights, of course, they were encountering these things more often, and the yeah. news reports started picking up on them. So, it would appear that most of them are occurring yeah. in the theaters. But interestingly enough, as we'll see through this, um, there were actually more reports in the Pacific theater than there was in, in, mm. the, uh, in the European theater, which goes counter to the idea that there were Nazi super weapons because yeah. by that time, Germany had already surrendered. Right. See, I could channel my deep inner Skirptard and... <laughs> You know, say that, well, things like the Marfa lights and these other weird electrical phenomena that are like balls of light that float around. People will see them on the ground or near the ground occasionally. And then maybe when you're flying these planes in formation up in the sky over certain areas, there's weird electrical phenomena and they seem to be like saying <laughs> Elmo's fire. Sort like of. moving in unison with the planes because yeah. the planes have some kind of weird, uh, you know, they're made of metal and they're moving through this energetic area yeah. or something. That's, That's covered. Not wah, wah. <laughs> well, it's not a bad script. No, part. no. Well, one, one, can, one very often, um, co one comment very often heard from the pilots is that they 
felt that they were intelligently controlled because yeah. they yeah. they maneuvered. They didn't just, although you know they did stick to the sides of the plane, practically or within a a set distance, like this one. It says uh, yeah. in science in in science news. Uh, released on January 13th, 1945, opinions were lear- were leaning towards enemy weapon. <coughs> it was reported that although the mysterious Foo Fighters had scientists guessing about the nature or their nature or purpose, they generally agreed that the objects were not radio controlled. They were convinced that there was no known possible way a ground operated unit could control the objects in tight turns, maintaining close proximity to the aircraft. Physicists felt that the objects were able to conduct such close formations with the air for the objects to conduct such close formations with the aircraft, there must be some kind of a magnetic force involved. Hmm. And they, if like the ones on the ground that weren't making any noise, if they're not displacing any air, then they wouldn't have any effect on the plane. Because if you're moving at 300 miles an hour and you get really close to another plane's wing, yeah, you're going to create air turbulence it says scientists continued trying to explain away the sighting accounts insulting the pilots and the multi uh, with course. a multitude of absurd reasons ignoring their observation skills combat experience and their intelligence foo fighters were always illuminated most of the time brilliantly they could remain motionless in the sky they could fly at speeds that were far surpassing the 600 mile an hour far surpassing 600 miles an hour in almost 100% of the sightings, no flak or enemy night fighters were observed, including jet-propelled aircraft. According to most crews, the jets, jets were distinctive and easy to recognize due to their flight characteristics. Most witnesses felt the Foo Fighters were pacing and observing their night fighters and were under intelligent control, but were not hostile. Hmm. On January 19, 1945, General Arnold received his latest edition of Command of the Commander's Intelligence Digest, which contained a section titled An Evaluation of German Capabilities. It included the heading of Radio and Radar, the German Air Force in 1945, Flak, Passive Defenses, U-Boats, and Counterintelligence. But the most relevant to the story was Other Weapons, which included Unexplained Phenomena. The report went on to emphasize that the large number of silver spheres, alternately described as glass balls or balls of cotton wool, have been reported during the past year at various altitudes. As far as is known, no damage has yet been de- definitely ascribed to the presence of this phenomenon. Hmm. Silver spheres. Cotton wool. This one's interesting. <laughs> On January 18, 1945, the Western Air Command of the Royal Canadian Air Force reported a baffling sighting. According to Captain Parker, he, he was at Oyster River near Vancouver Island and the Campbell River when he spotted a large silver cylinder or balloon. It was flying around 15 to 20,000 feet. He watched as it floated past Mount Alexander. It appeared, this is a quote, it appeared to discharge another balloon or object, which dropped out about a minute, which dropped for about a minute and then enlarged itself. The first balloon and object continued south while the second uh, balloon or object moved west out of the Butte Lake. Hmm. Enlarged itself. Like it swelled up? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um... On February 22, 1945, the 416th Night Fighter Squadron uh, Mosquito Crew was over central Pro- Po Valley. At 2,000 at 2000 hours, the crew observed three lights at 10,000 feet in the shape of a triangle. Now in pursuit, the radar operator was unable to make contact on his screen. Nonetheless, the pilot continued uh, on zeroing in for the kill his mosquito was about 2000 feet when the set light suddenly disappeared what all, year what year are we at now 1945 45 okay also in february of 1945 in new mexico sergeant l james l lease who was stationed at fort sumner air force base and ee e. dickey were driving south on San, on the santa rosa rosa highway at around three in the afternoon, they saw a glint of a flying object coming across the mountaintop to their right. Lee's commented that the object looked like a fast-flying P-38. 
According to Dickey, the object hung in the air near a small gas station about 12 feet off the ground. Huh. It remained motionless. Quote, the air seemed to vibrate with electricity, like one feels or feels or hears walking under a high line. Dickey commented, quote, then it suddenly swept away like a dragonfly over water. No turning. It looked like an upside down canoe shape about three to four feet in, at its highest spot. No protrusions. It was all it all happened so fast. The color was a weathered aluminum grayish. I tried to think what I had seen, uh, possibly slight holes on the side, but it was too fast out of sight in seconds. We knew we were seeing something that was not of our making. Yeah. An upside down canoe. And that was in New Mexico. <laughs> you can't picture that. Right? That was so weird. <laughs> New Mexico. Hmm. Um, let's see here. This is a rather long one. I'll skip this one. During the mid-morning hours of April 7th, 1945, a massive formation of B-17 flying fortresses was headed over the North Sea toward targets in Berlin. When Navy, uh, Navy Captain Louis Sol, uh, air, air, uh, Sol's aircraft came under attack by a German fighter. The aircraft, the aircraft dove in and leveled off and then rolled into a diving position and, and placed itself under the B-17. Oddly, the aircraft did not attack, however. It was understandable since the, it was not a German fighter. It looked more like a V-2, but was executing skilled maneuvers without wings. Once Captain Sewell's aircraft um, observed the wingless aircraft, it came to a complete stop. At this time, Captain Sewell's B-17 was positioned over the object with the ocean below. The rest of the crew and many of the crewmen flying in, in the formation witnessed the spectacle. Suddenly, the unconventional object accelerated to about 2,000 miles per hour. It raced out of sight. Once Captain Sewell's returned to the base, uh, his B-17 crews reported the sighting to intelligence officers. At this time, Sewell's radar operator had taken several pictures of the object. The film was rushed away for, de develop, for developing. Captain Sewell heard nothing more about the strange object and said that this was standard operating procedure. Mm, of course. So it came to a complete stop? Yes. But the, and that's, weird, that's a weird story because it says right when they observed it, it came to a complete stop. But it describes right. what it was doing before that. So that didn't make any sense. And they said it looked like a V2, but it was maneuvering, which meant V2s yeah. just, you know, they're ballistic. They don't, they don't maneuver. Yeah. A, ro a rocket. Like a rocket. <clears throat> right. Exactly. And, yeah, so it had no wings. And oh, what, what, did it say what altitude they were flying at when they saw that? Did it uh, say? No, it doesn't say. Okay. Because it, I mean, 2,000 miles an hour is pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I don't know how, you know, you have to take their, their speed estimates with a grain of salt because you don't know. they. Well, they had a know, radar. Well, they, on very few of these cases were the objects ever spotted on radar. Oh, okay. So they were seeing it, but it wasn't right. showing up on their internal, on their right. in-flight radar. Hmm. Which, I mean, <clears throat> suggests that the radar was going right through. It's transparent to radar. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Or, or it was around it or something. Yeah, yeah. It was cloaked. Yeah, because, I mean, the you can scatter it. Yeah. But they're not shaped like that. But he took photographs, and the photographs were taken. As soon as they landed, the film was taken and to develop or whatever, but they never heard about it again. S but, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out. You could make something that's transparent to radar, I guess. I guess, if yeah, if, the material, if there was the right materials, yeah. it wouldn't bounce off of it, yeah. We'll get to that in the next episode. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're coming close yeah. to, the, to the end here, and I also have a, since we've moved yeah, past see, the Foo Fighters. That's that's a stealth, the B-2, right? It's a stealth plane, but. Yeah, but the V-2 was a rocket. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, he was asking B-2. No, V-2. V2 but still, two, but my right. point is that this is a stealth plane, but it's stealth because. Uh, it can fly super low, right? No, it flies no, it super flies, high. It flies high, but it's got, ra you it's, know, the shaping has a lot to do with it, and then the material, the shape, coatings. 
Yeah, it's the material and the stuff. It doesn't. It, it scatters the radar. It scatters of, the radar yeah. because of the shape. Yeah. 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 And because of the material. And the material. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on April 26th, Curtis uh, General Curtis LeMay's 21st Bomber Command uh, Air Intelligence Staff produced a five-page report representing the most up-to-date information and theories on the balls of fire. Under the report, quote, Jane's uh, Japanese Air Defense Balls of Fire section, it stated, quote, in one form or another, as many as 302 sightings by 140 crews, which may, which may have been classified at, under the heading of Balls of Fire, have been reported. While a large percent of these sightings could have, could have continued or could have continued for as much as two to three minutes. Some have persisted for as much as 15 minutes. Another report from LeMay's staff dated May 10th, 1945, stated the balls of fire were circular or spherical in shape. Then on May 12th, 1945, the U.S. 7th Air Force Intelligence staff issued a five-page report which stated, quote, at the present time, no definite information has become available which would identify either the source or components of this unexplainable weapon. Hmm. Unexplainable weapon. All right. So, so the watcher's saying this, uh, just going back to the radar. There's stuff, the but, V2 rocket. Yeah. Yeah. But he's saying that the B2 yeah. is, has a low surface area that is reflective to the radar wave pinging back to the dish. Yeah. And then the, it's helicopters that fly, they fly low enough for, yeah, they can be below, below radar, range radar. Cause, yeah, because if you they're, stay they're low like enough. They're mixed in with the terrain. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So There's one last one for, because okay. I know this segment's about done. All right. This one's... Fine. <laughs> Tell your story. <laughs> in mid-July 1949, five F-6 Hellcat pilots stationed at Naval Air Station uh, Posca, Washington, Posca, Washington, received an alert. They were briefed that radar had detected fast a fast-moving object which was now sitting motionless over the Hartford Atomic Reactor Plant. Yeah. Arriving in the area around noon, the pilots had no visual on the object until they climbed up much to a much higher altitude. Then they saw the unidentified object. It was very bright and had a saucer appearance. The object, according to one pilot, was the size of three aircraft carriers side by side, Whoa. oval shaped and very streamlined like a stretched out egg of a pinkish color. He said he further stated that some kind of vapor was being emitted around the object's edges from portholes or vents. The quote, the vapor was being discharged to form a cloud for disguise. Oh, unquote. man. They placed a radio call to the base for further instructions since they were already closing in to their to their peak performance altitude of thirty seven thousand feet. Orders came back pushing the to to pursue the object at the expense of the aircraft's engines. They pushed the Hellcats to 42,000 feet, but it didn't matter because the object was hovering at an estimated 65,000 feet. Wow. The object maintained, remained stationary for another 20 minutes in its fixed position. Then it went straight up and disappeared. There was nothing in 1949 that could fly it. Giant altitude. pink eggs. <laughs> the size of three aircraft carriers. <laughs> God. Uh, they sound like warm and fuzzies to me. <laughs> <laughs> Cotton candy, pink color, pink yeah. wool. <laughs> I don't know. They're hot balls of fire. <laughs> warm and fuzzies. <laughs> Man. All right. So before we take the break, I'll tell this. This is uh, all the Foo Fighter talk. It's reminded me of this. Uh, Larry Niven wrote... Uh, one of my favorite science fiction authors, he wrote this, uh, I guess they made it into a book eventually, but it was a series of short stories, and I think they were originally published in magazines or, you know, like science fiction magazines as short stories. Yeah. And they were called Draco's Tavern, right? And the premise of the, of all the short, there was a whole bunch of them, and the premise of the tavern was, it was this guy who, uh, so after the war, after World War II, Maybe it was in the 60s. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it was set. But it was after World War II, and this guy had started up a tavern because uh, humanity had met aliens, basically. And they, the aliens showed up, and they traveled all over the galaxy, and they had these enormous ships, and they would show up with their huge ships, and they would all these people would—it was like cruise ships full of aliens. 
they'd all disembark to go do touristy stuff around the earth, right? And he had a port, he had a tavern, a huge tavern, like a bar in the spaceport where they would dock. And it was the only bar that would that had the ability to serve all these aliens because they all t they all had different <laughs> requirements yeah, and dietary requirements. Yeah, and yeah. some of them came in, you know, wearing bubbles full of weird liquids, yeah. and then they would ask for something to drink that would get them the, the equivalent of drunk, and he would have the chemicals <laughs> to do it right. So and we had this really massively complicated bar. So the, the but the point of the stories was that all these aliens are visiting, and it was always interactions between. The Draco, the guy running the tavern, and these aliens in the bar, and there's one where this, this weird—I can't remember what it was described as—but it comes up and it's all, you know, it it wants a drink and he brings it over, and it's sitting there just drinking this stuff all night. And eventually he goes over to talk to it, and he's like, you know, he's like, "What's the deal?" Because it's by itself, you know. And there's this huge party, and the thing like slams his drink down and is like, "Why are you not having a war, human?" And he's <laughs> like, "What?" And it's like, "You are not having a war." And it says something about how it's going to die or whatever. Anyway, he eventually finds out that these aliens had shown up decades before while the humans were having this huge war. And it was highly entertaining to them. And they sent out all these cameras to follow all the freaking. Oh, and he was like, that was you. All the Foo Fighters were the cameras of the aliens watching us fight each other. <laughs> it was like entertainment. Reality TV. <laughs> yeah. And they were, that's why they stayed right next to the plane. All the cameras, you know, and when you were describing it, there's one next to the plane and then there's a bunch out there. They're getting all the camera angles. <laughs> and so the alien was mad at him for not having another war. So he's just sitting at the bar bored. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was mad because they, they, they took all the footage. It was like they were the equivalent of like a, a reality TV show that uh, was okay. a startup. They took all the footage. They went back to their world and they made tons of money. They bought a whole bunch more stuff and came back here with a whole bunch more expensive equipment, and we didn't have another war. And now they're bankrupt. The alien's like, ah, oh, season four sucks. <laughs> right. He's like, why aren't you having a war? And the guy was like, well, I mean, y'all, you aliens showed up, and we've, you know, we, we, we kind of stopped doing that. But anyway, it was a great, Draco's Tavern, great stories. So that's the explanation for Foo, Foo Fighters. They were, they were camera drones. <laughs> Watcher said that three aircraft carriers was six city blocks. Wow. Oh, man. Yeah, 0.61 miles. Wow. All right, let's take a break. This has been great so far. Now we have wine and beer here at the uh, Brothers of the Servant podcast in the Tangent Queue with Marty, <clears throat> part three of UFOs. Yeah, because you don't have to do anything. That's so right. You can drink. I can just like. <laughs> Normally, I'm only, I'm the only guy that gets to drink in here. <laughs> Marty's doing all the work, so I'm just like, well, yeah, UFOs. <laughs> so where are we going next? You said yeah. you told us a whole bunch of uh, of of accounts. Right. That was a lead up. We're gonna shift gears now. Okay. So uh, in UFOs Part 1, we discussed how the Bethel Memorial Institute's top-secret pinnacle memo uh, written by Howard, uh, Dr. Howard Cross, uh, which aimed to withhold information from the CIA's 1952 uh, UFO investigation panel uh, headed by H.P. Robertson. Um, we discussed, we talked about the, the you know, H.P. Robertson being in charge of the CIA's you know, UFO research, but we didn't discuss why Robertson was selected okay. by the CIA. <clears throat> Just like we learned um, that Howard Cross was selected as head of Air Force's Project Stork due to his prior clandestine involvement in uh, UFO investigations at Bethel dating back to 1947, uh, on January 6, 1944, Major General S.G. Henry officially established the Committee on Counter Measures Against German Secret Weapons, which investigated the, the Foo Fighter phenomenon. Later, that morphed into the Scientific uh, Intelligence Advisory Section, um, 
Uh, and much to our surprise, the investigation was led by none other than H.P. Robertson. Hmm. In 1945, H.P. Robertson was placed in the lead position as the, of the first official Foo Fighter investigation. The Scientific Intelligence Advisory Section, which gave him complete access to all materials surrounding Foo Fighters and unconventional aircraft phenomena, including photographs, motion pictures, and he had access to some of the best engineers and scientific minds. Their expertise covered a wide variety of scientific backgrounds. At his, disposable, at his disposal was the intelligence agencies, the scientific fields, the scientific teams, and he had access to captured enemy military personnel, scientists, and technology experts. And due to his ties in London, he was able to obtain information on the phenomenon gathered by the British Ministry of, uh, over the years. On February 11th, 1945, um, the Air Commodore uh, Garrison sent a, m a memorandum to headquarters, which officially acknowledged that two investigations of Foo Fighters were now initiated, one by air technical intelligence to conduct firsthand interviews with crews and the second investigation headed by H.B. Robertson. But there was yet another group of men looking into the phenomenon from Washington. Uh, according to the 415th Night Fighter Squadron's commanding officer, off uh, Major uh, Augusper, Augusper, the visitors showed up at, and bypassed him, immediately contacting Captain Ringwald. The Foo Fighters were technically Ringwald's concern since he was the unit's intelligence officer and interrogated the crews. Major Augusper knew that the Washington men were definitely there to investigate the Foo Fighters and that secrecy surrounded the whole issue. Hmm. According to operations officer Captain Charles Horn, the men from Washington were skeptical people. They did not believe that the crews were they did not believe in what the crews were reporting and thought the men were going nuts and or needed a vacation and perhaps maybe to go home. Yeah. It was reported that the commanding officers of some of the night fighter units were forbade, forbade their intelligence officers to use the term Foo Fighter in their operational reports because the term sounded silly. <clears throat> they, they were not going to allow such nonsense forwarded up the chain of command. To ensure that, new, that this new mandate was followed, the squadron intelligence were instructed to inform the crews that they were observing jets or flares and not some kind of mystery object. This policy, if enforced, not only suppressed the facts, but it, sub it served to muddy the waters of an already murky subject. Yeah. So in a way, uh, what, are, what is the term now? UAPs or... Right. Now we're that, finding what we're, what we're finding I mean, out here is that that now we're, there was an a UFO investigation, what was you know essentially a UFO investigation almost 10 years before Project Sign or yeah. Uh, or that's not well known. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of the of the terminology. The, yeah, changes. the terminology because yeah, I can see how like a uh, a group of guys, you know, maybe they're 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 awesome soldiers or whatever, but still they're low ranking. They come up with some term to call these things, and of Based course, on a comic book, yeah. And they don't want that going up the chain of command. That makes sense. So it's like what they did instead of coming up with UAPs or something, they came up with call it flares or something else. You know, don't say it's un unexplained or unknown or. Yeah. Which is bad for the for studying it. So it's like at least now there's they've they've agreed on a term on the on the higher end, you know, like. Well, according the, to the other memo, just from the Night Fighter Squadron, there was three hundred and four reports. That's just from the Night Fighter Squadron. Yeah, and yeah, those yeah, are yeah. the ones that were referring to Foo Fighters. So right. now we're throwing into the mix that some of them might not have been called Foo Fighters. So how many were exactly? Actually seen? Yeah, yeah. It's good to have a term that's agreed upon by the higher ups is my point. Because yeah. now you can really count how many there are. Yeah. Uh, of, of significance, the, the Robertson panel report of 1953 had a section titled or a section titled Lack of Danger, 
which mentioned Foo Fighters. The panel concluded unanimous, unanimously that there was no evidence of a direct threat to national security in the objects cited. Instances of Foo Fighters were cited but were believed to be electrostatic, similar to St. Elmo's fire, or electromagnetic phenomenon, possibly light reflections off of crystals in the air, but the exact cause or nature was never defined. This is a demonstrative lie given the fact now that we know that Robertson was well aware of the finer details being reported by the air crews almost 10 years prior. Yeah. <clears throat> Robertson goes on to name David Griggs as a, the, a professor of geo, uh, geophysics at the University of California as being the, mo quote, the most knowledgeable person regarding Foo Fighters. However, he failed to mention that both he and Robertson had been aware, uh, had been aware and were studying the phenomena longer than anyone else, years before the well-publicized first flying saucer sighting reported by Kenneth Arnold. In 1947. So, so the interesting thing, I, I just want to say this, uh, <clears throat> the St. Elmo's fire thing, there was an interesting, I'm pretty sure this is right, but uh, sp I think it's called Speedbird 9. <clears throat> it was a plane that uh, got surrounded in St. Elmo's fire and all the engines quit. Right? And they would, they would, they were drifting down, and then they, they got the engines restarted, and they tried to regain altitude, and then the engines quit again, and then they had to make a, an unpowered landing, I'm pretty sure. I can't remember the story exactly, but what they eventually found out was that the plane was flying through a cloud of volcanic ash, okay, which was invisible to their weather radar at the time. Now, now I think weather radars are, are they're designed to see it as a as a <clears throat> obstruction in the sky and they they always make planes fly around any kind of cloud of volcanic ash but it was interesting because they're flying through the ash and it's almost it's you can't see it out the window it's it's almost right. invisible but it made the plane get surrounded in St. Elmo's fire and blew all their engines out right yeah so i was just thinking about that like <clears throat> if there really was that much St. Elmo's fire it would have killed all their engines that St. Elmo's fire is discussed in the book quite a bit. It actually yeah. it said the the flight crews were well aware of it. That was something yeah, yeah. they encountered on a regular basis. So yeah, okay. Is, they they knew that what they were seeing was not was Saint not St. Elmo's fire. fire. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, and and it also it usually will it usually actually is on the plane. Like yeah, the, the, the materials stick to the plane, and you can find it later, right? You, well, what I mean is, you can see oh, the, the see the fire. You can see the fire okay. on the. It looks like the plane wings are on fire with a purplish or bluish hue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like these guys were seeing these balls of light. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So the watcher saying Speedbird Nine, British Airways Flight Nine. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. If anybody's interested in that kind of stuff, check out Speedbird 9 and that flight. It's very interesting, and it changed the way they deal with flying mm. planes around volcanic ash plumes. That's cool. So all, uh, everything that we've gone over thus far has kind of been a setup for the what the real meat of the discussion is here, and it uh, it relates to who was, who was the sightings were being attributed to. Okay. Um, Edward Ruppelt, the head of Project Blue Book, stated, uh, quote, Every intelligence report dealing with German World War II aeronautic research had been studied and f to find out if the Russians could have developed any of the late German designs in the flying saucers. Aerodynamicists at Attic and Wright-Patterson uh, Wright Field's aircraft laboratories computed that the maximum performance they could have expected from the German designs, um, the des the designers of the aircrafts themselves were contacted. Could the Russians develop a flying saucer from their designs? The answer was no. There was no conceivable way the aircraft could have performed or matched the reported maneuvers of the UFOs. So is there a reason to believe that person? <laughs> well, this is this is uh, this was Rupolt's version. Or is, Odds are Ruppelt, just like anything else, everything's so compartmentalized. He only knew the yeah. information that he had access to. Right. But we're going to get into more of the details that would support some of what he's, you know, trying to say there. Okay. Um, 
Reginald V. Jones reported to his new job as scientific uh, officer on the staff of Britain's Air Ministry. Because of his background in infrared radar experimentation, uh, Jones was asked by Sir Henry Tizard, um, committee leader for the Survey of Air Defenses, to learn what the Germans were, were doing in applying science to air warfare. Reporting to the uh, uh, Directorate of Scientific Research, Jones was placed under the, the command of Wing Commander F.W. Witherbrown head of the Air Intelligence Branch. His section belonging to the Secret Intelligence uh, Service, SIS, better known as MI6. Within days of his assignment, Jones was in in the town of Bletchy Park at the estate referred to as Station X, where the place uh, where M- M- uh, MI6 stored all of their pre-war files. But Bletchley Park? Yes. Yeah. That's um, where they did a lot of the... Uh decoding stuff too i think says um for john the the files uh jones fi- uh, combed the files for hints of what hitler's luftwaffe was capable of and what secret weapons were at his disposal the files were a fantastic read a gold mine loaded with alleged true stories filled with wild reports of earthquake machines engine stopping rays pilotless aircraft atomic energy, and bioneurological weapons. Whoa. <laughs> the 8th Air Force issued a report in the September 5th Weekly Intelligence Digest article entitled Enemy Air Weapons, some of the reasons he's experimenting, uh, he's experimenting and some of the results of his labor. In reference to the radar-controlled weapons, the report stated, quote, These weapons were neither a dream nor a Buck Rogers invention as long ago as the end of the last war. It has been actually tested by reputable scientists, end quote. The Air Force concluded, It is one thing to correct them against still, tar- uh, still targets and quite another against fast maneuverable targets such as a plane. The report ended by stating, The poor results shown against relatively slow and unmaneuverable targets as surface ships indicates what might be expected of similar tactics if similar tactics are employed against aircraft. So what they're saying is that the radio control that they, they I mean, the Germans were developing radio control weapons, yeah. but here they're saying that they were not very effective even against ships. So what were their chances against fast-moving aircraft? Yeah. Yep, and then, you know, to, to do something radio-controlled on an object that's out of your sight, if you're just doing it by radar, yeah. because you don't have video feed, <laughs> it's like, going to be tough. Actually, yeah, gonna be really actually the Germans did experiment with with video feed. Over radio? Yes. Oh, wow. It, it was very crude, but I've seen vid- footage of it. It okay. was very, very crude. I guess it would be the earliest version of a smart, uh, you know, a, a smart uh, missile, but... Uh, very crude, but they used a joystick, and they were they were controlled like a they were for, uh, was it a Henkel Henkel one seventy seven I think it was a, a Henkel bomber. They would drop this guided radio linked guided missile, and they had this little joystick, and they could actually had yeah. a camera on it, and they could steer it into the. <laughs> it was not very effective because I can tell you, like having piloted a lot of drones, that moving from piloting the drone holding the controller in your hand and having to look at it in the sky versus having a video feed where you can watch the video feed on the controller and fly it from the perspective of the drone it's a huge difference oh and you can imagine i can kind chase of delay birds too. with with the video feed drone but the old one like there's no way yeah. you know there's no way you can <laughs> it's hard to tell how high they are or, yeah you know. exactly <laughs> you yeah. think you're right on top of them and you, no. <laughs> yeah and you and then you turn it the wrong direction yeah. or whatever because it's flying towards you and yeah yeah um <clears throat> I'm going to skip a section here, but it's uh, this is referring to some of the reports of uh, uh, other reports of weaponry that they were working on. And there's one of this is kind of relevant to a subject we'll get to later. And it says the files of the committee are being made available to G2 division in order to facilitate uh, continuity of work. Included is the intelligence information on crossbow together with many detailed studies, both allied and axis on, on pertinent subjects such as rockets refrigerant bombs, 
proximity fuses, electronic bombing techniques, and probabilities. Fuels for rockets, turbines, anthroid, which is ramjet propulsion, units, biological warfare. Ramjets? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's what, like, the V-1 used a ramjet. Okay. Um, German scientific institutions, personalities, balloon barrages, guided missiles, and this one's strange, artificial detection of Earth's magnetic field. Huh. Um, or these were some of Germans, uh, Germany's experimental programs. Right. Uh, on December 19, 1944, General George Strong, uh, Chief of U.S. Army Intelligence, sent a priority memo signed by jo uh, General Eisenhower to General Clayton Bissell, Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence on the, in the War Department stating, no, quote, no concrete evidence as to use of secret weapons has been obtained thus far with the exception of the report of a new long-range projectile. An Army Air Force spokesman at the Pentagon gave a brief official statement offering what they knew about the mysterious objects. His comments were supported in a, quote, special to the New York Times under the headline, Berlin's device is futile. Silver spears above city have no effect, Capital says. The December 21st, 1944 report stated, quote, no detectable effects have been noted but from the mysterious silver balls that the American pilots recently reported floating over Berlin, an official Army Air Force spokesman said today. The objects were described as silver or silver colored, but the Air Army Air Force does not know whether they are metal or and the spokesman said he added that the descriptions had been contained, the descriptions contained in newspaper reports um, sent to headquarters, um, were, had been sent to headquarters, and that there were no reports from the theater. And we know this is a state. This statement was demonstrably false. Yeah, they're saying they were not seeing them in the in the theater of warfare. It which was is, just newspaper. That's where they were actually yeah, coming yeah. from. <laughs> <laughs> So they're sending mixed messages. And again, here we have, just like we talked about in, in you know, part one, here we have the military sending mixed messages to the media yeah. that con seemingly contradict themselves. And I mean, that last report, he seemed to be saying that, like, the, the reports of these spheres all came from media and not the actual theater of war. Is that seem that's what it sounded that's like? That's what saying? right. That's what he's trying yeah, to say. <laughs> no, the media was getting the reports from the theater of war, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. On okay. It was a hoax fad. <laughs> <laughs> Another hoax fad. Uh, on May 14th, 1940, 1945, USS Sutton uh, received confirmation that German U boat 234 en route to Japan was <laughs> surrendering in the North Atlantic. On board were three complete disassembled aircrafts, an ME-262, an ME-163, and, an, and a ME-309 single-seat fighter. This was their, quote, high-altitude pressure cabin it was pro that was proposed for the Henschel 130 stratospheric aircraft. An, ass an assortment of jet engines and a complete set of blueprints and documents associated, associated with all of the above. Wow. But the 234 was no ordinary U-boat. A secondary examination showed that it had been modified to carry a very dangerous cargo. Set in her six adapted mine-laying tubes were 560 kilos of uranium held in 10 gold-lined containers. The loading manifest maintained that it was uranium oxide, the state of which uranium is found when it's extracted from the earth and safe enough to carry around in a paper bag. That the U- 234's uh, converted mine laying tubes were gold lined, indicated that the carbo, car, cargo was emitting gamma radiation. This in turn meant that the uranium oxide ore had been subjected to enrichment from, the, from a working nuclear reactor. The gold lining was there to prevent the radiation from penetrating the U boat's hull. What? Yeah, that's surprising. Yeah. That suggests that, that they, they were further along. Reactor. Well, yeah. they were further along than what we were ever told. Yeah, and we'll get to more of that in a bit. Uh, Was also, the sub supposed to drop that stuff? 
It was actually en route to Japan, and then they decided to surrender. Yeah, they defected or something. Right. And on board were nine Germans. Uh, at the top of the list was Air Force General Ulrich K uh, Kessler. He was, per uh, he was particularly well-versed in fire control devices, anti-aircraft guided missiles, and remote control missiles. Another passenger was Uber Lieutenant der uh, Luftwaffe, Eric Menzel, an air communications specialist, an expert in many fields who contributed to the development of new radar systems, bomb sites, radar reconnaissance methods, and radio control weapons. Others on board were August Bring Bringswald and Franz Ruff Bringswald. What, um, he was Will Measuresmith's right hand man and the measure and the measurements factory Measuresmith's factory top engineer, an expert on airframes for jets and rocket propulsion. And he was sent to get the ME-262s into mass production and get the ME-163 uh, program up and running. Yeah, the Messerschmitts were their, the jet right. engine fighters, so, right. right? So they were sent, yeah, the 262 was the first fighter. Uh, the 163 was the little yeah. comet. Um, these were being sent to Japan. Right. In other words, Germany had surrendered and they were sending, <laughs> they were trying to export their technology to help the Japanese. Yeah. So um, maybe they were bringing enriched uranium to the Japanese to start up a reactor or something or build that's bombs? That's what it would suggest because now this is coming from, from one book. I have information coming from two different books that they actually are both kind of saying the same thing, <clears throat> but little details are left out between the two. Um, the most important, but the passenger, the most important passenger to the Allied Air Intelligence was Lu Luftwaffe Colonel Fritz von Stardart, uh, formerly in charge of the city of Bremen's anti-aircraft defenses. He was involved with the latest experimental anti-aircraft weaponry. His background afforded him possible knowledge pertaining to the Foo Fighter mystery. Uh, okay. uh, interrogating officer Captain uh, Captain Hale asked Colonel Stardart. Allied crew member, uh, crewmen uh, operating over Germany late, late last year reported encountering colored balls of fire. What is the explanation for those balls of fire? Were they due to uh, the use of any, any <coughs> secret German weapon? If so, what was the weapon and how successful was it? According to Captain Hale's report, the prisoner of war asserts that the colored balls uh, encountered by air crews operating over Germany were only experimental weapons later shelved as impractical in operation. It was a weapon used by the Air Force and not by anti-aircraft units. Planes would climb far above the ceiling of the enemy bombers and, re and released with a time fuse, which theoretically would detonate on the level of the attacking formation. The success, however, Place the idea back into, or the lack of success, uh, place the idea back in the experimental phase. Uh, the prisoner is at a loss to give any further information and suggests that the technical people in the Luftwaffe, especially those familiar with experiments, would be the ones to approach. Mm. That was a bit of disinformation, as we'll find out. They did have, um, early in the war, um, the some of the bomber crews encountered these small, these, they look like coins. They were, they, they said they were like silver dollars that would rain down on them. Mm -hmm. And they weren't sure what they were. And they would stick to the planes. And they figured that they were testing some type of a explosive device, but no, no aircraft were ever harmed by them. But that sounds like what he's talking about. He's confusing yeah. the Foo Fighter sightings with this. Other, in other words, keep in mind that like these air mines that again the Germans were pretty good about compartmentalizing their inf yeah. their information as well. So he may not have been aware. Let's say theoretically there was a that the Foo Fighters were some type of a Nazi super super secret weapon. Yeah, the what he was privy to were these other weapons that were used. And using this time out. fuse. Yeah. But that's going to play into some of the information that comes later also. Okay. Um, so did any of these planes fly home with these little coins stuck to them? Apparently they did recover some, but they okay. didn't know what they were for. They that's they why for. I, they made the assumption that they must have been testing something yeah. that would be used later. Because they, they didn't have explosive, but they assumed that that was what they were It doing. sounds like 
poltergeist activity. You <laughs> know, they're raining down from the sky. Yeah, they're throwing coins at you. Little balls of light in the sky throwing metal, throwing coins at you. <laughs> it sounds like a poltergeist. <laughs> it's weird. So uh, the of uh, the 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 gentleman that worked at Measuresmith, um, one of the one of the informants says he saw the balls of fire over Munich once and assumed that they were some type of new anti aircraft defense operating on an acoustical pr- principle. Hmm. No definite explanation of the phenomenon could be offered. The RF, RAF's interrogation of the U-234 passengers had revealed nothing further than about the balls of fire other than it was a mystery even to the Germans. Yeah. Following the surrender of the, the architect of German East Luftwaffe, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, Goering um, was interrogated by General Spatz and was asked... If he had had a chance to go back in time and redesign the Luftwaffe, what would be the first plane that he would develop? Goring replied, jet fighters and bombers, especially the ME 264, the bomber that was designed to fly to America and back. Goring further stated, quote, I might, I might add that according to my view, the future airplane is one without a fuselage, a flying wing equipped with a turbine in combination with a jet and propeller. Mm. Near Gotha, a cache of approximately five tons of top secret documents covering the entire field of German arms development and industrial mobilization for war were located in a salt mine. Fortunately, they were recovered from Nazi SS soldiers in the process of of destroying them. Another incredible discovery of documentation was found in an abandoned mine shaft where 250,000 volumes of German patent uh, from the German patent office were hidden. Uh. Documentation relevant to the Foo Fighter investigation surrounded, surrounded radar and electronics, specifically known as the Schwarzsteinfeger project. The documentation contained radar camouflage and development of materials absorbing electromagnetic and supersonic waves and revealed Germany's progress regarding quote complete anti-radar coverage of submarines and other equipment unquote. Mm. so they were working on stealth technology yeah back in World War II you think some of these that some of this Phenomena. I mean, because that guy was saying that they might be acoustical, but that made me start thinking like, well, there were all kinds of weird, I mean, they were, it was brand new radar. Some of these planes had radar, the bomber planes, and then the, the Germans are shooting radar up there. Could that be causing some kind of weird electromagnetic phenomena that looks mm. like balls of light? But keep in mind that they they said there were three distinct types of Foo Fighters. Yeah. yeah. Some were single balls of light. Some were multiple balls of light in a row and then some had as many as 15 yeah they were blinking in alternating pa- patterns like a christmas tree yeah and some of these people reported silver structured objects they right were just balls of light and it yeah. depends in other words the ones that saw them at night saw these balls of light the ones yeah. that saw them in the day saw structured craft okay So on September 6, 1945, David Griggs and E.G. Schneider, Schneider, representing General Kenny's advisory uh, specialist group, arrived at at the Astrugi Airdrome with four other military officers and four men from E.L. Moreland's Pacific Branch, calling themselves a scientific intelligence mission, formally set up under Moreland's guidance. Moreland was the advisor to General MacArthur and headed the new scientific and technical advisory section of the Pacific Armed Forces General Headquarters. Griggs knew, quote, about three regions that generated a high frequency of Foo Fighter sightings over South Tokyo. Armed with an excellent interpreter, he was able to draw information from a huge list of important Japanese scientists at his disposal. In Tokyo, Griggs conducted interrogations and gained the confidence of one Japanese officer attached to the head, to headquarters. During questioning, Griggs relayed the balls of fire information to the Japanese officer who found, who in turn found the sightings just as interesting as the United States Army Air Force had found them. The circumstances in Japan were repeating just as those in Germany. The enemy seemed as surprised about the unusual sightings as the U.S. was. Hmm. So they started showing up in Japan too. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, the watcher's showing us pictures of that. Yeah, that's the HO-229. That's the world's first stealth fighter. Oh, man, look at that thing. That, that <laughs> plane was, was captured uh, or recovered during Operation Paperclip by the British, and they stored it away in a warehouse, and it sat there until the 60s. They had no idea what it was. Oh, wow. And they gave tiny. it. They gave it to the United States. They go, we don't know what this thing is or what you know what the, what its purpose is. So they gave it to the United States, and that got the ball rolling on stealth technology. Man, look at that thing. Yeah, it was that thing had a rubberized carbon coating to <laughs> absorb radar. Had the jet engines mounted inside on the top side so that you couldn't see the exhaust. Flying wing slender so that it couldn't be spotted by other fighters head on. Yeah, that thing was 50, 60 <laughs> years ahead. knew of, what they were doing. <laughs> God, it's, that's awesome looking. Yeah. Uh, oh, we got to take a break. Yeah. Good timing. Yep, good timing. <laughs> Man, that plane, is, that plane is awesome. This is really cool. Yeah. All right. We'll be back for the final segment, Fastest Two Hours of Podcasting. segment possibly <laughs> not sure but uh ready to get back into it what do you got buddy all right we're gonna shift gears again okay here uh, both during and following the second world war uh, german counterintelligence agencies were actively engaged in disseminating propaganda about several of the incredible <laughs> super weapons which would change the tide of the war and ensure a nazi victory um, some of this propaganda was relayed to the Allied intelligence agent, uh, agents as fact by former Nazis who either deliberately misrepresented the truth or those who had blind faith in the accuracy of the stories being circulated. Uh, rumors of German superweapons came in many forms, but none are more commonly cited than the Nazi flying saucers. Researcher William Moore has investigated the subject extensively and published a very informative article in Far Out magazine in 1993. The most commonly cited source for the Nazi flying saucer development lore is Italian technician Renato Vesco, who authored the book Intercept But Don't Shoot, The True Story of the Flying Saucers in 1968. In his book, Vesco states... The principle of symmetrical circular aircraft was combined with gyroscopic stabilization. This marked the rapid development of the Fuhrer ball, fireball, which finally became a weapon. Research indicates that the development of the F7 or the V7 Fuhrer ball, a circular aircraft powered by conventional jet engines, likely did take place near the end of the war. Um, evidence does support the construction of at least one and possibly more exper experimental prototypes. But test flights proved less than spectacular. Recovery of related documents and hardware may have led to the U.S. military's development in the late 50s of the VZ-9 Avrocar and the more advanced Project Y and Y2 Silverberg, Silverbug. However, like the Fuhrerball, these two failed to perform as projected. <clears throat> What was it called? The V, what the, the what'd you say? The V7 Fuhrer ball. Okay. Like the Fuhrer? Yeah. yeah. That's actually fireball, yeah. fireball fighter in, okay. in German. Um, oh. Be that as it may, Vasco's book uh, included claims of yet another fly Nazi flying saucer, the Kugelblitz, which means ball lightning. And this is where the true disinformation lied. Vesco wrote, quote, the Kugel, Kugelblitz, which apparently, which apparently for greater safety, combined the electrostatic firing device with an autonomous shortwave device manufactured by the patent for Wurgenton Getschalft of Salzburg, <laughs> <laughs> lumping together a single compact mass 
the wing and tail and fuselage of ordinary planes, but had nothing in common with them in either form or performance. It was the first example of the jet lift aircraft, unquote. After a single lucky wartime mission, the Kugel Blitz was subsequently destroyed by technical detachments of retreating SS troops. Vesco goes on to state, even if ufologists re refuse to admit it, the Kugel Blitz, the older brother of the Fuhrerball, is the authentic antecedent of the present-day flying saucers. And it is with them that the true history, or if you will, the prehistory of UFOs began. This belief was reiterated by W.A. Uh, Her 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 Herbinson uh, in his book Genesis, published in 1980. He writes, It is not confirmed, but it is very possible that the, that the German Führerball existed, that it accounted for many of the first modern UFO sightings during the Second World War, and that the extraordinary flying machine, the Kugelblitz, was successfully flown in Germany a few weeks before the war ended. The Fuhrerball, therefore, could have been the forerunner of the small, seemingly remote-controlled UFOs observed frequently through the final months of the war, while the Kugelblitz could have been the first of the large, pilot-controlled flying saucers. Proof of the disinformation campaign surrounding the Kugelblitz is contained in a declassified 1946 report by the Air Division U.S. Forces in Austria. Released in early 19 in the early 1990s through the Freedom of Information Act, as with all good disinformation, largely credible information is used to convey an inaccurate narrative. This is precisely what is contained in Vasco's account of the Cool Blitz. Moore states, virtually every detail turns out to be true except the most important one. The Kugelblitz wasn't a flying disc at all. It was actually being developed as an experimental anti-aircraft rocket. Hmm. The, declassified, the, the declassified Air Division report states, quote, the patent for Werktung Gatsch... Oh, man, Gatschel <laughs> Chef. <laughs> <laughs> the, the German guys <laughs> had an unimpressive start on on 1st September 1943 as a private firm for the development of certain patents. Kugelblitz was a high-frequency shortwave proximity ignition device for flak rockets. It was developed in three successive models, each an improvement on the previous one. The final model was ready for production in January of 1945, but never reached the production line. Parts of the Kugelblitz, but not the whole model, are at the laboratory site. It was intended to be used as an automatic ignition device for several of the German self-searching flak rockets in development. The success of the Kugelblitz proved in flight pro was proved in in-flight tests before the official committee at Arning Airfield, and the device was considered to be the best of all types. So, in effect... Um, the report reveals that the electro quote the electrostatic firing device with an uh, anagolus anagolus uh, shortwave device detailed by Vasco was accurate, but it was actually describing a proximity detonation device manufactured by the German guys <laughs> <laughs> for, for the use in flak rockets. So again, it was you know mostly accurate, yeah. but the device was. Completely a different thing. Um, so you can understand the secrecy of it. In other words, the patent really was related to a proximity switch. Yeah. Where before they were, and I kind of purposely put this in there. I just didn't emphasize it. But there was when I said earlier that one of the one of the uh, prisoner of war that was uh, interviewed said that the rockets used a timing device, and I said that was disinformation, yeah. is because they were actually testing the proximity switch. It was the proximity switch uh. that was the big secret. So, having said that, much of the following information comes to us from the outstanding book, The Hunt for Zero Point by Nick Cook, aviation author and editor for Jane's Defense Weekly. A central figure in the book is one of particular and one of particular relevance to this discussion is an individual named Dr. Hans Kamler. 
Kamler was an engineer who rose through the ranks of the SS, where he became the head of the Building and Works Division, designing and constructing SS concentration camps, such as the famous Auschwitz, as well as underground construction facilities for the V-2 rocket program. He was described as a cold, ruthless schemer, a fanatic in the pursuit of a goal and a carefully calcula- as carefully calculating as he was unscrupulous. As his influence grew within the SS, Kamler was eventually given full responsibility of all aspects of the V-2 program. Then in Febu- on February 6, 1944, Hitler transferred cradle-to-grave responsibility for all air weapons, fighters, missiles, and bombers to Kamler, who was viewed as the most powerful and influential state official outside of Hitler's cabinet. For his development of methodologies for increasing output of the gas chambers from 10,000 to 60,000 per day, he was rewarded with the rank of SS General Übergruppenführer. This gave Kamler... Um, I, with this, Kamler acquired control of every single air aircraft and aerospace program within the Third Reich. Hmm. Most of you have probably never heard of Kamler. This is because de- despite his vast accomplishments and rapid rise to power, historical archives contain almost no mention of him whatsoever. In fact, none of this information would have come to light had it not been, had it not been for a chance meeting. After extensive research, both inside and out of Germany, Nick Cook learned through a contact of a Cambridge graduate and foreign correspondent named Tom Augustin. During World War II, Augustin served as an air air photo interpreter, and after, he traveled to Germany to report on the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. While covering the trials, Augustin met SS Standerfuhrer, which just means Colonel, Wilhelm Voss and subsequently in 1949 conducted several confidential interviews with him. Although Voss was extensively interrogated by the counterintelligence intelligence, counterintelligence corps, none of the records or transcripts of the interrogations could be obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. Respecting Voss's wishes, Augustine did not disclose any of the information until he, until, that he was given until after Voss's death in 1974. Those details were published in the book Blunder, How the U.S. Government Gave Away Nazi Super Secrets to Russia. That's the book I told you I found that was 850 bucks. Oh, yeah. In the book, Augustine detailed how Kamler, unbeknownst to anyone outside of the project, created a top-secret research center for advanced weapons, or what we would today refer to as black projects. Voss was Kamler's head administrator at the Kammerschlab, the Special Operations Center located in a highly compartmentalized section of the Skoda Works in the Reich pre, uh, pre, uh, Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia in the then Nazi state of Czechoslovakia. Voss described the activities of the scientists at the Kammerschlab as beyond any technology that had appeared by the end of the war working on weapon systems that made the V-1 and V-2 look pedestrian. Among these were nuclear power plants for rockets and aircraft, highly advanced guided weapons, and anti-aircraft lasers. Whoa. Nuclear power plants for rockets. Man. Near the end of the war, Kamler recognized that his exploits would have placed him high on the list of SS officers sought by the Allies for war crimes. However, Kamler had something of value to deal, something tangible. Kamler told Albert Speer, head of Nazi uh, Nazi armaments program, he was planning to contact the Americans and that in exchange for a guarantee of his freedom, he would offer them everything, everything, jet planes as well as the A-4, which was the V-2 rocket, and other important developments. He informed Speer, Speer that he was assembling all the relevant experts in Upper Bavaria in order to hand them over to the U.S. forces. On April 17th, the Third Reich crashing around his ears, with the, with the Third Reich crashing around his ears, Kamler sent a message to Himmler at the SS command headquarters in Berlin, denying Himmler the use of a heavy truck 
that the Reichführer SS had requested from the Junkers Aircraft Factory motor pool. This was the last message anyone ever received from Kamler, who by April 18th had dropped off the map, effectively disappearing without a trace. Hmm. When Augustin searched for for records on Kamler, he discovered that his name hadn't even been registered at the Nuremberg war crimes trial. The very least that might have been expected for someone who had played such a prominent role in the Holocaust. Kamler was never tried in absentia at Nuremberg. There is no evidence that anyone ever bothered to even look for him. This despite the fact that there are four versions of his death which conflict with conflicting information and it and uh, remarkably, none of them stacks up under scrutiny. Kamler didn't seem like a man who would gamble his life on providing America with a technology that, had ar- that it already had ac- acquired via diligent detective work. Augustine's feeling was that Kamler would offer them something so spectacular that they would have no choice but to enter into negotiations with him. So is this implying that he was taken... In secret by the Americans, right? Here we have or that he just or that he escaped somewhere like we South have America. The, what they claim to be the most powerful person outside of Hitler's cabinet. Yeah, disappeared without a trace, was right. never tried. Yeah, and no one went looking for him. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, if he if he disappeared, people would have been looking for him. Right. So the fact that no one went looking for him. Well, yeah, Bre- the watcher's saying Antarctica to Antarctica <laughs> to Antarctica <laughs> to Antarctica. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, then people would have been looking for him. So it's like his his whole, like his, yeah, like the, his record was just, ex- you know, just yeah. wiped clean. And yeah, and he, he was became taken, somebody else. He was else. taken in outside of Paperclip. Ooh. Through a re- reliable contact, Nick Cook learned of a series of experiments that had le- had allegedly taken place in a mine in a valley close to the Czech border. They had begun, begun in 1944 and carried on into April of the following year, right under the nose of the advancing Russians. The experiments required large, large amounts of electricity fed via thick cabling into a chamber hundreds of meters below ground. In the chamber, a bell-shaped device uh, comprised of two counter-rotating cylinders filled with mercury or something like it had emitted a strange blue, pale blue glow. A number of scientists who had been exposed exposed to to the device during the experiments suffered terrible side effects. Five of them were said to have died as a result. Word had it that these results sought to investigate some kind of anti-gravitational effect. But Cook was skeptical. Yeah. His research had uncovered the existence of an SS-run Special Evacuation Commando, which means command or command unit, that had evacuated the bill and its supporting documentation prior to the Russians overrunning the facility. Cook inquired about the fate of the scientists operating the facility and was was informed that they were taken out and shot by the SS between April 28th and May 4th of 1945. Records show that there were 62 of them, many of them German, and there were no survivors, which is hardly surprising. The project had gone under two names, Lantern Tiger and Kronos and always involved de Glocka, the bell-shaped object that had had glowed when under testing. The bell itself was made out of a hard, heavy metal and was filled with a mercury-like substance, violet in color. This metallic liquid was stored in tall, thin thermos flasks a meter high encased in lead three centimeters thick. The experiments always took place under a thick ceramic cover and involved rapid spinning of two cylinders in opposite directions. The mercury-like substance was codenamed Zerium 525. The other substances used included thorium and beryllium peroxides, codenamed Lectrometal. Lectrometal. Electrum. (laughs) 
The chamber in which the experiments took place was situated in a gallery deep below ground. It had a floor area of approximately 30 square meters, and its walls were covered with ceramic tiles with a thick overlay of rubber matting. After approximately 10 tests, the room was dismantled and the compartment parts were destroyed. Only the bell itself was preserved. The rubber mats were replaced every two to three experiments and were disposed of in a special furnace. Each test lasted approximately one minute. During this period, while the bell emitted its pale blue glow, personnel were kept 150 to 200 yards from it. Electrical equipment uh, anywhere within the radius was used, would usually short circuit or break down. Afterward, the room, afterwards, the room was doused for up to 45 minutes with a liquid that appeared to be brine. The men who performed this task were concentration camp prisoners from Gross Rossen. During the tests, scientists placed various types of plants, animals, and animal tissues in the Bell sphere of influence. In the initial test period from November to December 1944, most of the samples were destroyed. The crystalline substance formed within the tissue, destroying them from the inside. Liquids, including blood, gelled and separated into clear distilled fractions. Plants exploded, exposed to the bell included moss, ferns, fungi, and molds. Animal tissues, including eggs, blood, meat, and milk, and animals themselves ranged from insects to snails and lizards, frogs, mice, and rats. With the plants, chlorophyll was observed to decompose and disappear, turning the plants white for four to five hours after the experiment. Within eight to 14 hours, rapid decay set in, but it differed from normal de decomposition in that there was no accompanying smell. By the, end of this, by the end of the period, the plants usually decomposed into a substance that had the consistency of axle grease. This wow. all sounds crazy. This is, just sounds like yeah. a lot of speculation, right? <clears throat> Cook was skeptical of all this information that he okay. was getting. People exposed to the program uh, complained of ailments despite their protective clothing. These ranged from sleep problems, loss of memory and balance, muscle spasms, and permanent and unpleasant metallic tastes in their mouth. It does sound like radiation poisoning. Cook was intrigued but not convinced as he traveled to the alleged location of the tests, which was called the Wenchless Mine, 50 kilometers or more the outside of a Warclaw, formerly Burslow of Lower Seler... Celestia, <laughs> around 350 kilometers from Wausau. Uh, upon arrival, Cook commented, in short, the Germans had gone to a great deal of trouble to ensure that the place looked pretty much as it had looked since the mining operation began here at the turn of the last century, a clear indication that whatever had happened here during the war had been deeply secret. The 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 site contained a power station capable of burning a thousand tons of coal per day, making the place entirely self-sufficient. But most striking was a con circular concrete construction, thirty meters wide and ten feet high, or, and ten high, with its twelve-meter-thick columns and horizontal beams, giving it the appearance of a hinge. Hmm. I think I've seen a. Is there a picture of that? Yeah, I've yeah. seen pictures of it. Yeah, Pretty okay. impressive looking structure. Yeah. The ground within the structure is, had been excavated to a depth of a meter and lined with the same ceramic tiles described as in the chamber that contained the bell. There were also high strength steel cable, uh, steel hooks set into the tops of the columns, which appeared to attach to something. Yeah. Something that must have exerted a lot of power. The structure was believed to have been a test rig a test rig for a vehicle or engine of some kind, one that was very powerful. Yeah, it kind of, like, uh, like you could think of it as a way where a NASA would mount a rocket engine to a fixed structure and then fire it off for a certain amount of time to test it. And they, there would be these incredibly reinforced concrete structures that the rocket would mount to. But this was a circular... Yeah, I think I remember seeing yeah. something about this on Ancient Aliens at some point. Yeah. Following the visit to the, the what, Venslots, uh, 
mine, Cook began to connect the dots. The Special Evacuations Commando Unit, which it was said to have evacuated the Bell, operated JU-290 and 390 transport aircraft on detachment. The JU-290 was a rare bird, and the 390 more so. The 290 had been a, four en- a big four-engined aircraft designed for maritime reconnaissance, transport, and bombing roles. The final variants were modified for extreme long-range operations. The JU-390 was a six-engine modification of the JU-290, and even more impressive. Though only two prototypes were built, they clearly demonstrated that the 390s they clearly demonstrated the 390s ability to mount ultra long range operations up to 32 hours of endurance it could also carry very heavy payloads when kamler had text, uh, telexed um, himmler on april 17th the last signal that anyone ever received from him refusing the reichführer's ss the use of the heavy truck from the junkers motor pool He hadn't been referring to a truck in the conventional sense. He had been referring to an aircraft, a long-range one with with a heavy payload. Kamler had been telling Himmler, his his superior, that he couldn't have the Junkers 290 or 390 for his own use because it was committed elsewhere. It could only have been for the use of the Special Evacuation Commando. Hmm. Kamler had the ability to vacuum up vacuum up all scientific activity, whether it was theoretical or practical, through an SS organization called the FEP, which was Research Development and Patents. Kamler could safely refuse Himmler's uh, permission to use the JU-290 and 390 without fear of recrimination. With such aircraft at his disposal, the commando could have flown its cargo and documents personnel and technology technology pretty much anywhere it wanted spain south america argentina or even would would not have represented a problem for such a long range platform yeah the watchers put up a picture of the of the 290 up here back in germany cook began to ponder maybe the, the nazis had initiated a, had initiated a flying saucer program <laughs> Maybe some of the technology had borne fruit. There were certainly enough anecdotal evidence to support the view that a variety of disc-shaped craft had been flown before the end of the war. It was simply that there was no proof. In his journey to Kamler's kingdom, it had opened his, his mind to the possibilities that he would not have begun to entertain a few months earlier. Via the Kamler Trail, A mounting body of evidence suggested that the Nazis, in their desperation to win the war, had been experimenting with a form of science the rest of the world had never remotely considered, and that somewhere in the cauldron of ideas a new technology had been born, one that was so far ahead of its time that it was suppressed for half a century. And we haven't even touched on Vi- Victor Schwarberger's repulsing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically, are you basically saying that the, the Nazi bell was a, this, you think this is a real thing or a cook did eventually he became convinced of it? Well, I've, I've listened to interviews with cook about this and he's on the fence. He says he's leaning towards believing that there, that the, that the bell was some form of nuclear device. Okay. He says he doesn't know that it was for anti-gravity purposes. He thinks that's speculation. Yeah. But he is convinced that the bell was a real weapon. It was something being developed. Yeah. But they just don't know what it was for. Okay. But there is enough anecdotal evidence to support the development. And the other idea that's being said here is that not only was it being developed, whatever it was... But this guy got away with the technology and went somewhere with it. And just vanished. And just disappeared. Now, there's kind of two points. That's one, is that there there evidently was some form of technology under development. But the other point to be taken from this was that even from all of this, this data, which, you know, kind of supports the idea that this stuff was being worked on, it's clear that this was 
at the end of the war. Yeah. That no nothing of any real substance had been produced prior to that. So yeah, they were still. Working in other words, on it. the Foo Fighters that were being observed were not this technology. Yeah. This was not yeah. mature enough to have been used during the war. Yeah. Now, what came of it after the war is a whole separate. Question. Yeah, yeah. You think this is a product of reverse engineering? It's hard to say. I mean, the Re the Germans were not afraid to test new ideas. They 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 definitely had. Um, the book goes into talking about how they kind of set up the uh, the groundwork for groundwork for what today would be called a, you know a special you know black project stuff yeah, where they're works. small you know small crews of. Scientists working um, with n not a whole lot of, uh, you know, oversight, yeah. um, which allows them to progress more rapidly with ideas. Right. Skunk works. Right. Exactly. And yeah. The closing, the closing comments on this kind of go in that exact direction. Says, he says, um, from 1933 through 1945, unconventional aircraft were, were observed around the world. These flying objects were given a variety of names. Mystery planes, ghost aviators, phantom flyers, freaks, meteors, comets, balls of fire, lights, the thing, and <laughs> Foo Fighters. Nearly a decade after the CIA's 1953 Robertson panel um, would state, if the term flying saucers had been popular in 1943 to 1945, these objects would have been labeled so. The balls of fire and Foo Fighters during the war became the ghost rockets of 1946. This new term was introduced primarily due to the flights of the objects over Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark. Yep. Eventually expanding through Europe, including Portugal, France, Tangier, Italy, Greece, and India. Hmm. I didn't by, know they were seen over India. Oh. By the summer of 1947, the term flying saucer had arrived and spread globally. Then in 1956, the U.S. Air Force began calling them unidentified flying objects. The dates, physical descriptions, flight characteristics, and non-aggressive nature of the unidentified objects commonly referred to as Foo Fighters, when compared to the historical record and statements from U.S., British, and German officials, themselves all but rule out the po any possibility that the objects observed prior were or, or during the war were Nazi superweapons. However, there is ample evidence to support the possibility that some advanced technology, although still in the developmental de develop develop huh, <laughs> developmental phase uh, at the end of the war, at the end of the war, were procured by the Allied and Russian militaries. Further development of these technologies post-war had the potential to result in hardware which may have been responsible for some of the UFO reports beginning in the late 40s. Okay. Yeah. Given the unit's experience with Foo Fighters during the war, in 2003, Major Augusper, commanding officer of the American 415th Night Fighter Squadron, was asked by Keith Chester what he thought the Foo Fighters were. He replied, quote, well, I think they were extraterrestrial objects of some kind. At that particular time, I didn't think much of anything like that. But as time goes by, I think they were something from outer space. I just believe those things. But what I saw, I think, was, an extra, was extraterrestrial, something from outer space. Hmm. So the air crews... Yeah, couldn't couldn't make sense out of it. Right. Now, whereas the char the flight characteristics were so unconventional, they did not believe they could have been man made. Yeah, yeah, and maybe we could make something like that eventually. But the idea here is, is that based on even their most secret technology that was that's being figured out later, uh, it doesn't seem like they had that technology, especially not the to make the ones that were showing up in the thirties. Right, and that's where you know I, I, every you know this is the third time I'll bring this up that the, the, the context issue that you you have to keep a, a frame of reference that doesn't discount certain periods. In other words, it's very easy to look at what's going on today and say, oh, well, that's military top secret military yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's easy for people 
to say, oh, you know, the Foo Fighters were were secret Nazi developments. Well, but you have to look at the big picture of things and see that these same objects were seen prior to the war when we know there's no way that yeah. these things existed. The, even the ME-262 didn't show up, which is, you know, their jet fighters didn't show up till near the end of the war. They showed up <laughs> too late to make a difference. Right. So how could they have had this, these, you know, the technology to develop craft that could hover fly up into the sky and disappear and everything prior to the war. They would have been used throughout the war if that yeah. was the case. Yeah, especially if they had ones that were three football fields long. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, that's, that's, ter that's terrifying, you know, if that's being used as, as, a, as a weapon against you, you know. Right, so I'm, I'm and, kind but, of skirting down the middle. I'm saying, were there Nazi super weapons? Yeah. During the war, no, but they were working on things that we may have seen post-war. Yeah, and there were Nazi super weapons, but they were conventional weapons that we could understand. But yeah, they rolled out a military full of weapons that no one had ever seen before. I mean, that was part of the thing that terrified everyone with the with the war. You know, it was they were, it was scary. And how many, uh, how much of the things that they talked that they were working on might have become a reality? You know, yeah, things related to Earth's magnetic field and yeah. <laughs> you know, laser weapons and all these. You know, yeah, it's hard to say. You know, some you know, a lot of it might have been disinformation, but who knows? Some of it might have. They might have actually been worried. Doesn't mean that they ever got anywhere with it, but yeah. they were, they weren't afraid to try new things. Yeah, yeah. And I think we've talked about this before, but I. I have the same problem sometimes with <clears throat> with the idea that some of these things are are modern military weapons because I'm like, well, why aren't they ever used? You know, we go to war with somebody and I don't ever see any flying saucers shooting lasers at people. <laughs> well, the silver bullet theory, I mean, is valid. In other words, uh, during the war, during like World War II, um, it was qual quantity. In other words, they built hundreds of individual aircrafts to, to perform tasks. Yeah. That changed as we got into Vietnam. They started getting more specialized and they started figuring out, uh, you know, that they could do more with less. That was kind of the idea that um, the F-117, it only represented something like 10% of all all uh, aircraft used in the Gulf War, but it was like represented like 60% of the damage. In other words, they were doing a lot with a little. Well, yeah. The concept is that we have these silver bullets that they may only develop a handful of them, and they're oh, very specialized, and they're probably kept in secure hangars and only taken out on rare occasion. But they're there in case you ever need them. Yeah, um, and they may but have. You made this point with the with the with the hostage situation in Tehran. Correct. Right? That there that that before all this happened, there was this sighting of this craft that did all this stuff and just ma made their their air force look like crap. But then we like strapped rockets to a, a big plane trying to get in there to get the hostages out, and it totally failed. Right. So, like, have, why didn't they use that silver bullet if they had it? Right? I have a lot of notes for the <clears throat> that aspect that w would we would look at. We could discuss um, comparing, you know, modern day observations um, and using that, you know, that context of looking at, well, were these exact same things being described in the 30s, in the late yeah. 1800s, you know, it's, it's, we, we tend to have these knee jerk reactions and say, well, that's probably just military. And I agree. It's, it would, you, the, the, you know, Occam's razor, it's most likely a military <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, aircraft. But when you're having seeing things that have been described for over a century, yeah, that unless <laughs> unless we've developed time travel, yeah. that's very unlikely. In other words, <laughs> yeah, this was something that was pre-existing. Now that doesn't mean we didn't eventually develop learn it. how to develop our own versions of that technology. Yeah, yeah. recovered through you know crash material. There's no telling, you know, that's, but I would say there is no doubt that we have technologies out there that would seem practically supernatural. Yeah, I bet yeah. you we have very high speed, amazing aircraft, but how do you make the distinction between the ones that may not be, yeah. for and all other, we know, they may not be physical. Right. 
that's the other thing is like, yes, I agree that our military probably has stuff that would look like magic. But I bet you if you got the blueprints, you would be like, oh, I see how that works. For the most part, it's got a turbine in there somewhere. It's using airflow and fuel. In other words, it isn't using it. It, it won't float, you know, and then and then dive down into the ocean and then take off up into the up into the stratosphere in a couple of seconds. Like, I don't think we have anything like that. Maybe we do. But if it is, it's so completely different from all the jets and stuff that they're still building. Well, it is. Then why wouldn't they be incorporating some of that technology into the like, you know, why wouldn't you stick that in the jet? It is interesting that the Navy has been so vocal about their investigation of the Tic Tac UFO and all this, and the Air Force has been totally silent. Totally silent, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, like the Air Force is like, yeah, that was us. Sorry, guys. Yeah. (laughs) That's that's possible, yeah. I know that uh, that's the left-hand, right-hand thing. You know, these branches of the military don't know what the other branches are doing or whatever. But is, you know, then then you're like, okay, well, why was the Air Force buzzing the Navy? And, you know, is that just like they're just like, ha ha, check this out. You know, I, and I and wouldn't there weird. be, you know, <laughs> wouldn't there be communications go, hey, man, you're doxing us here. <laughs> what yeah, are, what yeah. are you doing? Putting the video on the Internet. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing is like to, what. My other problem with some of this stuff is if it's super secret, super, super, super secret military craft, why are they flying flying it over giant cities really slow so everyone can see it? Like the Phoenix Lights, you know? It's like, okay, that's a giant super secret military craft, and then they just fly it over Phoenix? Theoretically, some of it could be (laughs) psyop, you know? I don't know. And why would you fly it with with other uh, Air Force pilots? So that they would be reporting like, hey, I saw this weird thing in the sky. There's no point in doing that. Yeah. So that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And again, we may not be looking at one thing. Yeah, there may be, absolutely. There may be a mix of things, and it's hard to determine which ones are ours and which ones aren't. Yeah. There's Nazis in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one one question about the breakaway civilization, because that you know I know that's another aspect that didn't we didn't dive into, but the uh, the breakaway civilization stuff, um, saying well you know Nazis created a, a base in Antarctica and well surely given the technology we have we would know that they were there right yeah okay well you know in the fifties and sixties. Because of the Cold War and and fear of an attack, we developed the distant early warnings, uh, yep. you know, yeah. radar, radar array and, uh, right. over the horizon. Right. To be able to detect aircraft coming in, yep. bombers or whatever, right? So logically, if that was true, we would have a due line south because we would be afraid of aircraft coming from the south. Yeah. Why is there not one? Well, there might be. I don't know if they do. They have any OTH down in the? No, I mean I'm, I'm right there. I mean it would have to be in South America or something. That's what I mean. I mean Mexico yeah. you put it down at the, down at the tip of South America. I, I don't think it That's would be tough it. to build a, you know, a construction project that large without it being detectable. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas I think it'd be pretty much common knowledge. I mean, a dew line was common knowledge. Yeah. I mean, they had to develop all types of you know special, you know transports and stuff to be able to do it of yeah. course you know of course the conditions in it you know yeah up in the other possibility is you just have ships in the area all the time looking for it because they have oth possibly i just it, i just i have difficulty with the breakaway civilization but it may, thing well yeah only I'm, because they may have a treaty so like the idea of a breakaway civilization that that some part of the gov- of the major world governments have knowledge of that there is a, an agreement and part of the agreement may be that you're not going to be building any installations that's why you can't build bases in Antarctica. But how do you get every nation <laughs> in the world to agree not to fight with one you know it's just not it's not human nature there's always if conflict they have UFOs <laughs> well, I mean <laughs> I mean like <laughs> I don't know. That's that's the whole Somebody, point. Yeah, we went that, back and forth. That through. in itself would be, you know, cause for some to try to recover that. In other words, I don't think any nation is going to allow uh, uh, some other nation to have a technology without responding to it. In other words, if if the if 
if some breakaway civilization had some super hyper advanced technology, all the other superpowers would be doing everything within their you know ability to try to recover it and duplicate it. Unless there was some kind of agreement that there was a trade of that information. But yeah, I agree. But then that would put them at risk. It would put them at risk, yeah. Yeah. The only way, you know, the only way you keep a secret is to limit who knows about it. Yeah, exactly. You know, but if so, if all the nations in the world know about it, every it would be, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to keep it a secret. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the big, the, the biggest part of a breakaway civilization is that it hides. And so you would be high, like they may know you're in Antarctica, but where? <laughs> it's pretty big. Yeah. And if I mean, you're under the ice, you know. If you had uh, anti-gravity technology, you could also be all, <laughs> all over space. Yeah. I mean, it's just like wherever you want to be. <laughs> yeah. You Nazis be there. in space. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm just saying it's like it's. It wouldn't be a, necessarily a landmass that they're like, oh, well, we need to be looking to the south because yeah. you could just go into space and come down from wherever you want. Right, but yeah. I, I would think it's unreasonable to believe that they could have had that technology in, you know, post, you know, shortly after the war, late 40s. Yeah. Early 50s. In other words, there, there would have to be some, you'd have to see the evolution of the development. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the, you know, the accounts of the flying craft that are doing things that are you know, basically impossible. Yeah. Taking off at speeds, you know, instantaneous high speed travel, you know, that it's like there's no inertia or something and like, or they're just moving space with them. (laughs) (laughs) Watchers posting hilarious pictures. (laughs) Yeah, so, well, and the other thing, like, Bosley has some good books on this, interesting books on breakaway civilization that started in the 1800s, where the technology started to begin being built in the 1800s. The Nimza stuff. It's pretty good. You probably should, you you should get the books and check it out. But if that was the case, why would we not have seen rocket technology mature until the 50s? You know, we... They started using them in the in the forties to a degree. We didn't really see them mature much until the fifties, and then yeah, I think in the in the in the NIMSA stuff, they never there was no they never were using rockets. They didn't even go through that phase. Uh, I can't remember all the details, but it's really interesting stuff. Um, But I don't know. It's the the question always comes back to what are these things we're seeing in the sky, right? And you saying like, well, it might be many things. Yeah. So it's the possibilities are military craft, very secret military craft, breakaway civilization stuff, single inventor things like some crazy guy just builds something awesome. You know, at least that was I mean, that 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 was something that would happen in the past. You know, somebody would build a balloon and just go flying it somewhere that we're talking. I'm talking about centuries ago uh, and that would freak people out. How long have people been using balloons? That's not even really Did clear. you guys see the news story where there was like a guy seen flying next to Air Force One? No, it was a guy. <laughs> yeah, they're like looking out the window and they're like, that's a dude with a jet pack. <laughs> He's like flying next to Air Force One. What's up? <laughs> what? Yeah, you didn't see that? No. Yeah. It was, uh, it was like a couple of weeks ago or something. You know, it, maybe a month ago. Wow! Like I said, some and of they're this... thinking that it was this. That there's this company that makes these jetpack wings that you put on and right those suits. They have a little like a wing suit and it has yeah, a little engine. It's got a little yeah. wing and they. It's you're just in a suit and you're. <laughs> it's not like the Lost in Space backpack. That <laughs> no, thing was but like it, I mean, it's a jetpack. I think it only fly for like wing. thirty seconds or something. And they they drop them out of a plane. Oh. And they, they just then they take off and then they parachute down when they're yeah. Done. You know, it's possible that some of the things that are being observed are not, are also not necessarily physical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they might be manifestations or uh, perception of something that's in reality quite a bit different. And that's something we definitely will have to cover at some point. Yeah. So that's some information. Going through the list military, breakaway civilization, single inventor, crazy guy. Uh, and then nuts and bolts, actual aliens or 
and or consciousness based something else, interdimensional, whatever you would call it. I don't even know if those are separate categories or not, but or I guess interdimensional would be a separate category from consciousness. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. But the, it starts to get fuzzy there. But yeah, there's a lot of possibilities and maybe it's all of these things. Uh, you know, the breakaway civilization idea is interesting. Uh, it's not really my go to for it, though. Uh, I, I, but I don't really have one. I don't really know what to think about all of it. I still don't. I mean, we've done three shows on this now, and I've read tons of books about this subject, and I'm still just like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, you know, people have, have been no idea. having this exact same conversation for nearly a century. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know, and maybe there are, uh, you know, it's not a uh, breakaway civilization, but uh, a completely, <laughs> you know, separate civilization you know living in under the sea how many yeah. ufo reports that's do we hear about them going in and out of the ocean that's the other possibility is you it's know? just a whole other civilization that has been living here on earth for forever and you know, they're either underground or underwater or both or these mountain like at the beginning when we started about the reports about potential a mountain, mountain base. base yeah we've heard those yeah. you know we've these are recurring yeah. themes that yep. you know doors opening in the sides of mountains and flying saucers coming out yep right yep it is it is a recurring theme. I like that idea that it's, you know, that we're not the most advanced civilization here. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and in that scenario, you could imagine an agreement with all the world powers. Yeah, right. That they would have to keep secret. Right, and the and this other... otherwise, <laughs> how do you attack something that lives deep beneath the earth? What would you even do? And these, uh, this other civilization doesn't necessarily need to look any different than us either. Yeah. It's hard It's hard to say. There's It could be us, just a previous version, you know, people who went underground and survived the uh, some previous cataclysm. I mean, there's, you know, we've this, this merges into the ancient aliens idea, but... Yeah, and they would be, you know, pale skinned and... Yep. You know, like... Because they live under the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> under the ground. They under the water. All, yeah. Like huge eyeballs and stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> living in the dark. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that was that was a fantastic show, man. Well done. All nuts. Yeah. All <laughs> What's the... What about the... What about part four? What do you got for part four? What are you going to do? With that? Uh, we're going to we'll get into perception and uh, maybe some of these modern day sightings. Get into All right. some of the finer details of that hardware okay. stuff. Well, thanks so much for coming out, man. It's yeah, always buddy. a blast. <laughs> Too much ground to cover. It's, <laughs> it's always fun, though. Well, good thing the UFOs move really fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys know all the stuff, all the ending things. Brothersandservant.com, check us out. Pyramids. Pyramids. Schemes. Schemes. And we love you. Yeah, always have. Always well. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Thank you.